I've never told this story to anyone before, simply due to not having any answers and thinking that there's nothing that can be gained from telling it. But eventually I figured, why not? Maybe somebody knows what I saw. Many, many years ago, at Wongi Campgrounds in Queensland, Australia, my father, my friend, and I were out camping for a couple of days. Usually it's packed, but we went during the week and got two days off school. I can't remember the reason. I think it was just because my dad had a few days off, but that's beside the point. Due to it being midweek, the grounds were empty. We've been here many, many times before, but never alone. However, we were excited due to having the whole grounds to ourselves. Cool, right? Now, we're no strangers to the Australian bush. We know what to look out for. We know how to play it safe. So at night, knowing that nobody was around to mess with our camp, we decided to go for a mini bushwalk to the other side of the river that runs along the grounds. When I say grounds, it's just a clearing in the middle of a bush, not a properly established grounds, and it's far away from all the roads. We got to the opposite riverside, and looking out to the river, we could see a bright light just near our campgrounds. Thinking it could have been the fire, I mean, we put it out, but they could easily relight, we walked back through the bush to our site, still able to see the large light. However, when we got to our side, we realized that it wasn't the fire. As we were able to be closer to the river this time, we saw that the light was over the river, not in it, but over it. We were somewhat scared, but thought that there had to be some explanation for it. Maybe a flashlight or a torch, something along those lines. Maybe a torch or something along those lines. But looking from where we were, there was nothing under it. The light was a good 70-ish centimeters above the water. And still. Dead still. The light itself was flickering, sort of like a fire. But it was in no way attached to anything. It was just a large ball, like between a tennis ball and a soccer ball, floating and giving off a strong fire-like light, but more like a light bulb center. This went on for maybe 30 minutes as we tried splashing the water and trying to figure out what it was, but it didn't move. It didn't do anything. It just floated at that one spot, in complete silence, unlike the sound a fire would make. My dad decided to go get the torch and his camera, and of course, being the scared 12-year-olds we were, we went with him. As soon as we got to the campsite, which was maybe only a hundred meters away, the light was gone. We ran back with the torch, but there was nothing there, and no one there. No other campers. It was just... gone. We didn't really talk about it, because we didn't know what it was, or how it was there or why it was there. Min Min lights are something that are very popular in the Australian outback, and that's the only explanation that I've got for it. But they have no explanation, so it's a dead end. When I was 14, I went camping in the summer with the girl guides. We only traveled a few miles away, to a place we had visited a few times before for game nights. Each year, our guides would merge with the two others in the area for a huge camp out for about five days. The place we were staying in was rumored to have a ghost in the main house. The story says it only shows itself to members of the family. We were staying on the large estate near the woods, right away from the house. I had been there quite a lot, and I knew the grounds pretty well, which was awesome. I was staying in a tent with the younger girls, who ranged from ages 10 to 13, because I didn't have my own tent like the other older girls did. The first day and night went smoothly. We built a climbing frame, lit candles in the dark, and pretended that we had landed on an alien planet. A silly, fun game, but it's part of the story for later. The next morning, 
Me and one of the other girls got up early. Our group's job was to collect firewood for breakfast, so we ventured into the woods on our own. We were joking around, grabbing wood as we walked. We ended up at the obstacle course and decided to play on it for a while, even though it was technically out of bounds. When we were done, we grabbed the firewood and started walking back to camp. The woods, to me, they felt and looked strange. It was as if the place was slightly different, slightly off from how I remembered it before. I decided to start trying to scare the girl I was with, just messing around, you know, trying to spook her for fun. Well, she got spooked and ran off and left me behind. That backfired. But I wasn't bothered as I slowly walked back. That was when I saw movement to my left, then again up ahead. As I was about to leave the woods, I saw a man out of the corner of my eye. He was wearing a white t-shirt and a cap, and carrying something long. Looking back, I think it was a shotgun. There was no one there. But I shrugged it off. Stuff like that doesn't bother me. I've seen stranger. Once out of the woods, everything goes back to normal. I looked back, and the woods were exactly as they should have been not like they were a few moments ago. I don't know how to explain it. They just seemed newer for a while. Not as wild, I guess. But everything was kind of grainy and misty, except there was no actual mist. It just felt that way. It's really hard to explain. So I don't say anything more. I enjoy the camp out. We play games, sing songs, and just have fun. On the second to last day, we play a game. We had landed on the alien planet, and once we had breakfast, we had to go hide in the woods, build a shelter, a fire to make food, and people had to go steal food from the campsites without being seen. I am left in the woods on my own for ages as the other girls go about stealing the food. I built a pretty awesome shelter, but I realized that I needed my pen knife, which I'd left in my tent, so I went to get it. I get to the tent to find the kids I was sharing it with, bawling their eyes out, totally terrified. Eventually, I get the story out of them. They'd been making their food when a man wearing a white shirt and a cap had appeared and then vanished in front of them, just where I had seen him. I assured the kids that it was fine and that whatever it was couldn't hurt them, and they eventually went back into the woods, but they were seriously shaken. I got the blame for telling them a scary story, but I had only tried to scare one girl at the very start, and I'd never mentioned anything about the man to anyone. That night was the campfire. As it ended, we all ran through the pitch black woods back to camp, leaving the person looking after us all alone in the woods. She had a light, so no big deal, right? She had to make sure the fire was out. I found out a week after that she had been terrified walking back to camp and refused to go into the woods again after that. In fact, she's refused to camp at that site ever since, but she won't tell us what she saw. The last day, I got bored packing up. After everything that had happened, I was kind of in a ghost hunting mood. So, me and a couple other girls went into the woods. I'm in the lead and I'm walking along a path. I stopped walking and I hear footsteps in front of us. Clear footsteps walking on dead leaves, but there were none. No one was walking anywhere near us, either. I followed the sounds along a path. Someone had heavy boots on. It was so strange. We all had trainers on. The girls I was with were completely silent. They could hear it as well. I followed the sounds around to a clearing at the very edge of the woods where it stopped. I decided to sit down on the grass, and the other girls followed me, but they sat behind me because they were scared at this point. I do the whole, if there's anyone here, can you give me a sign routine. As I finished, a white mist suddenly fell over the woods. You could see things moving behind it, nothing clear. It hung in the air as the other two girls ran off screaming. I sat for a minute and watched it, before saying, Thank you. As I said this, it was like a gust of wind hit, and it was gone. But there was no wind, 
just felt that way. It was totally awesome. That was the last of the strange things for that camp. We had to finish packing up and left the camp that afternoon. I've been back a few times since and nothing strange has happened. The woods have always felt normal since then. It would have been a strange enough experience, but it got a little stranger when I did some research later on. Remember how I said that the ghosts there, by legend anyway, only showed themselves to family members? Well, a few years after this trip, I found out that I'm actually related to the family that owned the house and the estate. This happened to my girlfriend and I about two years ago. We were both in our late 20s. Thinking about it still makes my skin crawl and my heart pound. We camped for the night in Stanislaus National Forest near Big Trees, California. We were only about 15 minutes off the main road, but still in a pretty remote area. Basically dirt fire roads and nothing but trees in all directions. We arrived in the early afternoon and set up camp in a nice clearing at the top of a hill beside the road. We drank some beer while we cooked dinner, saw maybe four cars go by in the hours between when we arrived and nightfall, all hunters leaving the forest. By about 7 p.m., the sun had mostly set, and it was getting dark. The solitude and peacefulness of the woods was nice, but it felt just a little odd being so secluded. I have been camping probably 50 times, but I've always been with a larger group or at a dedicated campsite. After dinner, when it was dark, we hung a bear bag with all of our food and stuff, smoked, laying back on a blanket, and looked up at the stars. I was feeling good and pretty much forgot about the fact that we were alone in the middle of nowhere. We got into the tent and sat in the darkness and talked for at least an hour. I'm a tall guy, but my two-man tent is high enough that I can sit up inside of it without a problem. The rain fly was laying on the top of the tent, kind of flung over the top, but not attached or staked down. It was fully covering one side and draped over so that the other side was mostly unobstructed. We had a clear view out of the mesh siding, and the trees were barely illuminated by the moon in front of us. Here's where it gets spooky. I'd been doing a lot of browsing on Reddit, and I decided to tell my girlfriend about r slash three kings. Basically, it's a sub dedicated to this spooky ritual where you sit in a darkened room at 3 a.m. and set up a candle and two mirrors. And through some combination of supernatural forces and sleep deprivation, images appear in the mirrors and speak to you. I was having fun scaring her, and to be honest, I was scaring myself a little too. The woods were dead silent, and there was absolutely no wind. No rustling, no air moving, at all. It would have been very easy to feel even the slightest breeze sitting like we were. I paused in my story, and as I did, the rain fly started to ever so slowly draw back from the top of the tent. It didn't fall, it wasn't blown. Honest to God, it was as if somebody was carefully pulling it down from behind us. I'll never forget the sound it made. We turned and stared at each other, wide-eyed, and my heart was in my throat. The fly continued to slide ever so slowly down the tent, until it was completely off. It was too dark to see clearly behind us, but my mind conjured all the nightmarish beings I've ever seen in horror movies. I'd like to say that I sprang into action and ensured our safety, but I was literally frozen in fear. What a feeling. We sat in stunned silence for maybe ten seconds, until I finally found it in myself to grab a flashlight and look behind us. There was nothing there. We breathed a huge sigh and started whispering feverishly, What the fuck? Did you... I got out and looked all around the clearing, but felt stupid after a while, and we went to sleep. 
The next morning, we woke up early and packed up camp. It was sunny and quiet, and I was happy to be in the woods, but I couldn't shake the eerie feeling from the night before. I was on my knees rolling up the tent, but I kept glancing through the trees around us, kind of compulsively, and my girlfriend was packing up breakfast about 30 feet from me. Again, there was absolutely nobody around, no birds chirping, no animals in sight. Then I heard from directly behind me two quick thwacks, like thock, thock. They were loud and about two seconds apart, sort of like the sound of an axe hitting a tree, but a little blunter. I would judge the source of the sound as within a hundred feet from me. My girlfriend sprang up as I wheeled around to look behind me, but there was nothing there. We both said, okay, time to go, and left in a hurry. My heart didn't stop pounding until we were back on the main road. I've never been so thoroughly spooked for such an extended period of time in my entire life. I hope this story was interesting to some of you. Let me know if you have any idea what we experienced that night. When I was in sixth grade, I lived in a small town in northern Iowa. There was one little forested area just outside of town. My friends and I all lived in a trailer park, which was attached to the forest. We decided to go into the woods one night and just mess around. We were in there for around four hours when it happened. We were in the dead center of the woods, not having a care in the world. We were just standing and talking at this point. I heard footsteps and crushing leaves behind me. So I turned around and saw a figure standing there, just staring at me. My friends asked me what I was looking at, because they couldn't see what I was seeing. I told them that there was someone there, and then I realized that it didn't want to be seen. This must have been why I was the only one who saw it. It ran away when it noticed me staring back. My friends did hear the footsteps retreating from the area, but only I could see the source. We had decided to quietly and slowly walk out of the woods without encountering anything else that could be potentially dangerous. That did not save us from the terrifying sound that emanated from the general area that this thing ran toward. It was a loud, shrieking sound that closely resembled that of a hand moving up and down the strings of a piano. But it had a rusty and coarse sound added to it. We got the hell out of there as fast as we possibly could. We all decided not to stop and talk, we just kept on running to our own trailers. We never spoke of it after it occurred. I'm not really sure what we experienced that day. Based on some research, I think it could have been a banshee, but I'm not entirely sure. This story begins in either 2012 or 2013, I don't remember which. My two sisters, my dad, my stepmom, and I all went on a camping trip. I don't remember exactly where it was, but it was somewhere in England, and it was next to a farmer's field in a small town area. So me and my two sisters, Laura and Amy, were just messing around outside, playing, running around, things kids do. When all of a sudden, my sister Laura says, What's that? And points to an object in the sky. It was about 15 to 20 feet from the ground. This black, balloon-like object was moving in a straight line. Like, extremely straight. No twists, no turns. It wasn't going up or down, either. And it didn't seem to be affected by the wind. It was going at a constant speed in a perfectly straight line. It was about the size of a party balloon, but it was all black. The string or thread at the bottom wasn't swaying in the wind, either. At first, we thought it was just a stray balloon, but it couldn't have been. Because, like I said before, it was moving at a constant speed in a straight line, and I've never seen a balloon do that. This thing really disturbed me, and it actually made me feel sick to my stomach. When we got home two days later, I recalled the event to my older brother Jonathan who didn't come with us that time. He told me that it could have been a drone or something like that, 
But this thing was dead silent, and it didn't seem to have any of the equipment like propellers and other things that drones typically do. I'm not sure if this was some kind of spirit or alien spacecraft. I don't really know what it was, but if you do, I'd love to know. I live in Indiana, and my parents have recently developed a love of camping. They've camped out throughout the state, but their favorite has been Summit Lake State Park. They've been asking me to camp with them forever, and I finally caved in and decided to go one weekend. That day, I bought a little tent for myself and a sleeping bag. I was excited to try camping for the first time and stopped by to get graham crackers, chocolate, and marshmallows, for s'mores, of course. Finally, I hit the road toward Summit Lake and was feeling great. I had my music on in the car, and overall I felt good. I get off the highway and take a country road toward the park. Suddenly, in an instant, I go from feeling excited and happy to extremely depressed. This sudden mood change rarely happens for me. I have no diagnosed psychological problems, no mood disorders, no history of anything like that. But for some reason, I just wanted to start crying. It's really difficult for me to explain this feeling, but everything around me suddenly felt different. The colors were off. I had a cloud of sadness hanging over me. I just wanted to turn around and go back home so I could curl up and cry in my bed. The rest of the camping trip was fine, but that experience on the way there, running across that pocket of negative energy or whatever it was, was so impactful that I didn't want to go back there. I was just talking to my mom recently, and she was looking at places to camp this weekend. She mentioned Summit Lake and asked me if I'd like to come again, but I said no. I told her what happened to me last time. I told the story before to my brother and a few of my friends when they asked me about my first camping trip. I told her the same story as I did to them. Once I finished telling her my experience, she was completely silent. And then she said that the exact same thing happened to her in the same place. She told me that she and my dad would be singing during the ride, but once they get off the highway, she gets depressed and just wants to cry. They may even argue. Just like my experience, she was excited and happy, but then a strong urge to cry washed over her. She said that this happens to her every single time, but she's always provided some sort of excuse for why she's feeling that way, and since it goes away as soon as they get there, she figured it was no big deal. She even said that she was hesitant to say the same thing happened to her after hearing my story because it seemed so unreal. I tend to be skeptical when it comes to paranormal things and things like negative energy, but I had to look up if anything happened in that area. I googled Indian massacres in Indiana because that's probably what happened, right? And the first thing that pops up is the Fall Creek Massacre. In the spring of 1824, a group of white settlers slaughtered nine Native Americans, including two men, three women, two boys, and two girls. Guess where? Right when you get off the highway and on to the road towards Summit Lake. I still tend to be a skeptic, but this experience has made me believe that negative energy in some form exists in places where awful things have happened, such as the site of a massacre. This happened many years ago but it has to be the creepiest thing I've ever experienced when it comes to this kind of stuff. And one that I can't really explain to myself. This happened while I was camping with a few friends of mine. While the others took a bath or just hung out around the campfire, I decided that I would take a short walk through the woods, which I did. When I arrived at the entrance to the woods, I suddenly hear a woman humming a tune in the bushes the thing that I find creepy as hell is the fact that I was completely alone. No one was with me. I had clear line of sight into the bush, which I know for a fact was empty. No woman, no radio, no music, no other campers, 
nothing. Yet I still know I heard her hum. It was clear as day, like she was standing right next to me. I ran back to the campsite where I told everybody else. Of course, nobody believed me. I'm still not entirely sure what happened, but this has to be the creepiest experience I've ever witnessed. About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington State. For the life of me, I can't remember the name of the park. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one that was made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before, and so has my husband, but we've never stayed here before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or calling out to Jesus and it goes away. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also have to say that while I've read a lot about sleep paralysis, I've never experienced it until this night, and I haven't since. Once we're all in bed, I start to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me in kind of what's like a blur. I'm unable to shout or scream or move, but I'm very aware. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot or so demon looking thing. In my head, it feels like it's something with horns. It's difficult to make out and its face is absolutely terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming, are you okay? I told him I was fine, and I tried to go back to sleep, but the same thing happened again. Except this time, the demon thing was closer to me. I remember in my head shouting, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm, wakes me up, and said that I was still screaming. At this point, I still told him that I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again. And again, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, it wouldn't leave, and my husband kept having to wake me up. This time, I told him what was going on. He said that he was really sorry. I didn't try to fall back asleep that time. I just wrapped as much of him around me as I could and desperately tried not to fall asleep. He was my only protection, I felt. I felt like something was trying to pull me into sleep, but I fought it. The next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I've never researched the area, I can't remember the name of the campground, that I was so terrified that I haven't really shared this story until recently. I have no idea what happened to me that night, but I hope it never happens again. So my friend's grandpa has this cabin property up a canyon in Deschain County, Utah. It had a fire burn through a few years ago and the cabin was lost. Now it's just a bunch of burnt trees with quaking aspen saplings popping up everywhere. Last summer, my friend and I went up there to camp because it's pretty out of the way and it's private land. To get there, you have to go through a road blocked off by a locked gate, and everything is super overgrown. Getting there was really tough. I say all this to make sure that you know that we were definitely alone up there. This is not an area people can just happen by. You would have to know where it was, how to get there, and then tough through it. 
Anyway, we found a spot to tent up above his cabin on the gravel roundabout road that circled the cabin. That night, while settling down, we heard a sound outside our tent. It wasn't a small animal, and it wasn't a four-legged creature. It sounded like two heavy boots walking. Anybody who walks in gravel knows the difference between two feet walking and four feet. It went all around the tent, and then left. Needless to say, we slept by our rifles that night. Not sure how related it might be, but the property is around 30 miles south from the infamous Skinwalker Ranch as the crow flies. We haven't been back since. I was camping with my girlfriend at the time. We did the normal camping things, setting up the tent, making a fire, and so on. It got late, so we let the fire die down and went into the tent and laid there for about 30 to 40 minutes, when we saw an orange glow coming from the other side of the tent. We went out to look, thinking maybe the coals of the fire had lit back up or something. We didn't see the fire, but off in the distance, we saw an orange, hazy ball of light bobbing around in the air between the trees. When we stared at it and began discussing what it was and whether or not we should follow it, it stopped moving and just hovered there a moment, before slowly taking off to the left. We knew that in that area there was a really nasty drop-off, so we didn't follow it. We were thinking about what to do and went back to the tent, pretending it never happened, and after some difficulty, we fell asleep. We woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of what we assumed were trees falling. Later, when the sun was up, we went outside to look around, but didn't see anything out of place. I have no idea what happened to us that night, but it was definitely one of the creepiest camping experiences I've ever had. My best friend B and I whistle back and forth. We've been friends for a few years, and it's something that we picked up. When she's trying to locate me, or when I'm trying to get her attention, we whistle. A real simple, one single high tune, followed by one low tune. We decided to take an off-season camping trip in Pace in Arizona. We didn't expect it to be as cold as it was there, and we didn't expect to be one of the only three campers on the mountain. One of the evenings we were there, the campers next to us said they were expecting up to five inches of snow through the night. So I made it my mission to get as much firewood as I could before the sun went down. I got all the wood around our campsite, right next to the lake, but I was still not satisfied. So I decided to take Bee's forerunner out of the camp and up into the woods. When I made it out of the campsite, it got pretty eerie. There's just something about being alone in the woods that makes you feel like you're not alone in the woods. But it's nothing I haven't done before, and I had my pistol on me. So I managed to push past my paranoia and get some wood. I was driving and walking for a good hour, got a few more bundles, and I was driving slowly past a clearing when I see this fresh log overturned. It was a beauty, and I had to have it. So I parked the runner and started trekking through. I got about halfway, and I hear a whistle. Two-toned. One high, one low. Really close to me. If I hadn't seen my friend in the rear view at the bottom of the rim, I would have assumed she was just messing with me. I stopped cold, did a full 360. But sure enough, I was alone. I hightailed it to that log, sprinted back to the runner, and went back to camp. I found B chilling next to the fire. I'm not really sure what to make of it, but it scared the heck out of me. In college, I lived up on top of a mountain road, but still only five miles to town, down a trail through the woods. There was a hundred plus year old oak in the yard, slab stone porch built by hand. I lived in the studio apartment that was outside of the main house. The main house was haunted, but my shack was cozy. The woods up there were weird, too. 
I never really was in the main house at all, but the three who lived there said some nights you couldn't sleep for all the noise. Floorboards creaking, thumps and knocks, that kind of thing. My experiences happened outside. Like I said, I hunted small game up there, as there must have been a rabbit colony in the vicinity, plus a few squirrel drays. Often out there while I was stalking, I'd get the distinct feeling of being stalked myself. Keep in mind, this stand of forest is only several acres, but was preserved mainly because of the historic oak trees scattered around. It's old woods. I would hear laughter, like children's laughter, but not quite like in a creepy movie. It was a bit distorted, and almost like flirty giggles that you imagine a fairy might make. It would come from a different direction each time I sought it. I eventually decided to stop following it and hunt. It never did stop. I would sometimes spend an afternoon in town having drinks or hanging at my friend's place. I'd finally leave and have enough liquid courage to hike back up the trail in the dark. That laughter would be replaced by noise, just like things running all around you and dashing about in the trees. I've been an outdoorsman for a long time, and I know the woods are noisy at night, particularly in the southern Appalachians, but this was different. It was dead silent out there, in that stand at night, except for this rushing to and fro by some unseen feet. Not like game fleeing, though. Deer run away and crash about doing it. I was a big-time night owl back then, and was regularly up doing schoolwork until three or four in the morning. One such night, it had just snowed a fresh twenty inches or so, decent accumulation for the area. Our yard and the woods were like a paradise for me and my dog. I was excited to hunt around the next day for tracks and see if I couldn't locate the rabbit den precisely. I was up working and the dog came scratching to get in, not frantic or anything. I let her in and she lay down to sleep. Odd, because she's a husky and preferred the snow to my tiny heated apartment every time. I decided to call it a night too and went out for a cigarette. It was 3.24 in the morning. I can still see it on top of my MacBook display before I closed it. I went out and noted that the clouds were dispersed a bit and the moon was bright on the snow. I lit my cigarette and was just looking out across the fence and into the woods when something caught my eye. It looked just like a silhouette of somebody leaning against one of those big oak trees, like you'd see somebody with a palm planted against a wall with the arm straight out, leaning against it. It's not moving, so I can't tell if I'm just tired, or the lighting is funny, or what. So I walked further to the end of the porch, and as soon as I stepped off onto the fresh snow, it took off. The thing was tall. My estimates based on that tree put the thing at seven feet. It ran along the border of the fence and back off into the woods. It was hairless, as far as I can tell, and completely naked. Otherwise, though, its form was just that of a tall, skinny man. I went inside and switched to boots, grabbed my rifle and my flashlight, and I went to check the tracks. I picked up what had to be a set of size 14 or 15 barefoot tracks. It ran along the fence and down the treeless stretch of backyard, as if heading into the woods. But then, the tracks just ended about 20 feet short of the wood line. I don't know if it jumped to the tree line or what. It probably could have, but there weren't any more tracks that I could find that night or the next day. It was like it just vanished. Never could explain that one. So this happened last year in Virginia and is also the reason I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time, and we ended up with a three-day weekend in June. So, I thought it was a great time to go explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search, found a state park with a trail that looked nice, 
and let my roommate and family know the trail I was going to be on. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stop. I went in to grab a map of the area, just in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known that has a pretty cool waterfall and a swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park, but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and my parents about the new trail, and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days and two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people, and some of them are really fun to talk to. As expected, I got further and further from the main trails, and I saw fewer and fewer people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds, no bugs, not even wind, and I had the distinct feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good size area to swim in, so naturally I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. That's when I heard something whistle the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me, so I went back and forth with it, and it would repeat whatever I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was being watched again. Like I would get goosebumps and my hair would stand up on end. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make some dinner. As I did this, I became hyper aware that again, there was no sound, just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I wasn't safe and that I should leave. I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I woke up the next morning, my sight was trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found. My bear bag with my food was cut down and the contents were thrown across the site. My first thought was that a crafty animal had chewed through the rope and got the bag. But I looked at the rope and it was cut with something very sharp. Plus, none of the food was even touched. I also noticed bear footprints human footprints, all around my campsite. Keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from any road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction. I saw nothing. But I heard that whistling again. My whistle from yesterday. But it was different. It sounded more sinister. It made my hair stand on end, and this is when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed up my camp as fast as I could. As I did, the whistling got closer and closer as I finally finished stuffing the tent into my bag. I didn't even bother with putting anything away properly. I just wanted to get out. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with it and finally I stood and yelled into the woods, shut up, what the hell do you want? It stopped whistling and it was quiet for a moment. And then it repeated everything I had just said in my voice. It sounded just like me but distorted, like it was coming from an old television. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and ran in the direction I'd come from. I heard it moving, just behind me, 
fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but never being too far. Eventually, it sounded like it got farther and farther away from me, and then it suddenly stopped. When it stopped, I stopped and turned around. I wish I never had, because I heard the most bone-chilling screech I've ever heard coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again. I didn't look, I just ran. Less than a half mile, I ran into a couple that was also backpacking. They saw the look of terror on my face and asked if it was me that had screamed and asked if I was okay. I told them about what happened and they decided not to go down from where I had just come from. We moved to a more populated trail and as quickly as we could, all got the hell out of there. As soon as I got back in my car, I drove to one of the park's ranger stations and reported what had happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction, but that they would send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station's parking lot runs right up to the woods. As I was getting into my jeep, I hear the whistling coming from the woods just in front of me. The neighborhood where I grew up was more or less suburbs, except the back end of it borders a massive field where nothing has been planted for decades. Part of that border is buffered by woods, and it's in those woods where my friends and I would always play. One sunny day, we were particularly deep in the little section of forest. We were attempting to pick through what looked like very overgrown dozer tracks. The woods are thick across North Carolina, but the central and eastern portion is thick with kudzu in particular, and it was giving us hell. We had probably made a mile of progress into this track when we came across a depression full of water. I hesitate to even say that it was a pond because it was perfectly round like a crater. The water had obviously receded and in the middle of it was the exposed roof of an old car. At about that time, one friend found a license plate under the pine duff. It was tagged with buckshot. Next, a door. A full car door, half buried under pine duck, riddled with bullet holes and shock. Certainly not an uncommon way to have fun in the South, go out, have a few beers with your buddies and see some old junk. But what we found next wasn't a run-of-the-mill Saturday night. Bones. Our still innocent minds first assumed it was a white-tailed deer. We started dragging out bones and laying them out side by side. I'm not sure if our objective was to make a museum quality deer skeleton or what, but that's what we did. Then, the pelvis came up. I recognized it immediately, because my uncle was a chiropractor, and had a full model skeleton in his office named Mr. Bones that I would always look at. The more I started to look at our growing collection, the more I started to see Mr. Bones taking shape. I got this weird gut feeling, and being the oldest, I told everybody to stop digging and that we needed to go. There was some protest, but I convinced everyone that this was the best thing to do. We hiked back the way we'd been coming in and went back to the pool down the road, finished out the day, and went home. But I couldn't stop thinking about those bones. That night, I told my mom about what we had found. Then I had to tell Dad the story. At first, they weren't convinced, but I wasn't a dumb kid. I knew what I had seen out there. They talked behind closed doors, going back and forth. The next day, I told the story to two sheriff's deputies and took them to the area where we had entered the woods. About an hour later, there were police vehicles packing the tiny dead end leading off to the woods. Chainsaws cleared brush, and men in white shirts with detective badges smoked cigarettes and talked amongst each other, as men carried bags from the forest and put them into vehicles. Then they were gone. 
I waited months to hear something, anything, nothing. I asked my parents what had happened. Did they figure it out? And over time, their answers would get more and more uninteresting. Eventually, I quit asking and forgot about it for the most part. It faded into a memory, fuzzy and dreamlike, the way childhood memories are. Eventually, I came home from college and I was sitting out by the fire with an old neighborhood friend who had been there that day. He saw everything I saw. We started talking about it after a few beers and got curious about the outcome. We started researching online and couldn't find a single word of information on a skeleton discovered in our neighborhood. It was baffling. I asked my parents the next day, and they said they had no idea what I was talking about. His parents said the same thing. Whatever happened that day, whatever they found, it was intentionally buried and forgotten. To this day, they all hold adamant that it never happened, but we hold adamant that it did. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy. This one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and things like that, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we would use llamas or mules to pack our gear. All the while, we would sleep in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail, near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington state. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macabre Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves, meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal, before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants, they constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here for over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal was to allow guided tours to take place at some time in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain wasn't difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. 
We would hike the five mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we would need on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days. Usually we started our morning hike at around 7 a.m. and we began our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse at around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we could call the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, the weather had turned, and we'd be lucky to see two to three people in an entire day doing the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around 4 p.m., and my co-worker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark. My rationale being that the more trips I did today, the less I would have to do tomorrow. We passed on the trail... I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun started to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun and making visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I fail to spook easily. Having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry, I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and even ran into a few demented hillbillies over the years. As I left the prairie that evening, though, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted from my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly... I found myself wanting to walk faster, to jog, and then to sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself that I had been reading far too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so before I started to hear something faint, something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and still at least two miles from civilization, that civilization in reality being likely the only other soul out there, my co-worker. Sure enough, however, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faint, I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it. The steps on the wooden boardwalk were too loud and covered it up. Every time I paused to hear it, it became unmistakable. It got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence, other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the noises of life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano. It was as if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it. But this was different somehow. Unique to this location. Unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't quite recognize the composition. Unsurprising, since I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow I felt that it was meant just for me in this moment. I started walking again. Almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax. The perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of the music. And then, as quickly as it came, the piano stopped. 
whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off. It didn't fade into extinction. It was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation, and weight of everything was just lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life, somehow, was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, nor did I sense anything unusual. I told my co-worker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. I told my grandfather about what happened. He was a retired park ranger who had worked at nearby Mora just the next station over. Without the least bit of hesitation, he goes, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or just the piano this time? This story is from when I lived off the grid in the forest of western North Carolina. Some friends and I all lived in these small shacks, essentially a shed with a loft. They were very close together, so we all lived together in a community. Living in such primal and close conditions breeds a kind of deep, trusting friendship that you just can't get from living anywhere else. Naturally, we did almost everything together. By our little semicircle of houses, there was a railroad track. If you followed it south, it would lead to a waterfall. This waterfall, in particular, is where everybody would go to get high. It was a normal night, humid, sometime in early July. A group of about six friends and I, Laura, Andy, Nick, and some of Andy's friends that I didn't know that well but recognized, decided to walk out to this waterfall in the dark. I was the only sober one in the group, so I felt a higher sense of responsibility for everyone, and was therefore on edge and hyper-aware of our surroundings. Others would walk faster or slower, or stop altogether in the group. So it was natural, and expected, that we wouldn't be able to see everyone at the same time. Andy was in rare form, though. When Laura had to stop to pee, he came out of the bushes and scared her, and then ran off ahead behind the rest of the group. This pissed off both me and Laura, since it was such a clear invasion of privacy and unnecessarily spooky in the already creepy night. Laura and I eventually got to where we could see Andy again, but he was walking by himself, and then he slipped back into the bushes without even looking at us. Dismissing it as him just being affected, we kept moving forward. Still not back with the whole group yet, we realized that Andy had followed in behind us, just far enough away that we could only see his silhouette. Finally, we catch up with the rest of the group and see that all of us are accounted for, even Andy. We asked him how he got ahead of us and beat us to the group, when he had last been seen at least 15 yards behind us just minutes ago. Everyone went dead silent, as Laura and I realized that whoever had scared her when she peed, and whoever had followed us after that, wasn't Andy or anyone else from the group. We never made it to the waterfall. When I was a junior in college, I went camping with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Pennsylvania. We had reserved a campsite that was pretty remote, pretty deep in the park, way up on one of the mountains and not near any of the other campsites. It was located at the end of a narrow dirt road maybe about 75 feet long, which itself broke off from the main road, which was also dirt. There was nothing at the end of the little road except for our campsite. We parked at the entrance and spent the day hiking up to the site, setting up camp, and then hiking around. We made a fire, made dinner, and then turned in. 
Not long afterward, we discovered that one of the guys with us snored, loudly, like walls of the tent shaking snores. Truly deafening stuff. After probably an hour or so, the rest of us gave up on trying to sleep and climbed out of our tents, leaving our loud friend snoring away in his. My friend at the time was a DJ for our school's radio station, and she had a late night show. I think she was on between midnight and 2 a.m. Since we couldn't sleep, we trekked up to the main road, where the reception was a little better, and where we would actually be able to hear the radio over the snoring. When we got to the road, we stood in a loose circle near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, a black pickup truck, with its lights off, appeared out of the woods and passed us, very slowly. It was unmarked, not a ranger. We listened to the radio for maybe half an hour or 45 minutes after that, and we even briefly called in to say hi. Finally, though, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves toward the tent, coming from the right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. We hadn't bothered to put up the rain fly, as it was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon, so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it, just as the black truck pulls into our campsite, still with its headlights off. Then it shuts off its engine and sits there. Our friend is still snoring. I have a little knife in my tent, and I know my other two friends have at least one in theirs, but we have no other weapons, no guns, not even bear spray. So we just watch. As I said, it's a clear night, and I can see the truck just fine. It's maybe 20 feet from my tent, but I can't see who's in the truck or how many people there are. Nothing seems to move inside the truck. I still remember the metallic clunk sounds as the engine cooled off. I honestly have no idea how long I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear her breathing. I could hear that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. It felt like it was a really long time. It had to be at least ten minutes that went by, but it could have been a half an hour or more. We just kept waiting for something to happen. Nothing did. Eventually, the truck starts up again, and then backs up along the narrow, dirt road. It never turned its lights on. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from, and that was it. My friend burst into the tent a second later. Now we're all talking. Did you see that? Holy shit. But our friend is still asleep. Eventually, we just went to bed. We packed up and headed out in the morning just as we had planned. And yes, we checked with the park, and they don't own any black unmarked SUVs, nor did any ranger come to check on our site during the night. To this day, we have no idea who they were or what they wanted. When I was working as a backpacking guide in western North Carolina, my schedule dictated a full eight-day shift with six days off. During those six days, myself and other co-workers would play in the woods. In the summer, you can't beat a mountain swimming hole. One of our favorites was called Paradise Falls, alternately called Wolf Creek Falls. This is a cliff jumping spot with a huge swimming area, a tiny slot canyon, and an inner pool. Most will venture to do the small jump into the inner pool. Even though it's the smallest jump, it's arguably the least accessible. Even though the jump is nine feet at most, you have to work through a 10 minute rock scramble to get to the top of it. We were all venturing in, and from inside the tiny canyon, you can't see the main pool. 
Well, we got to the jump and coaxed the first person off, a fellow guide who had never been to the spot before. She jumped successfully and swam out into the main pool and beach area beyond our eyesight, and then screamed. Because she was now out of sight, myself and another guide jumped in together and swam the short distance to her, with others in tow. Of course, we figured she was injured somehow. She was treading water and just staring, wide-eyed at the riverbank. When I looked to the shore, I saw what she had screamed at. There stood a man. He was massively large, easily 6'6 and a little change. He wore beat-up overalls and no shirt. There didn't appear to be a hair on him. Perhaps the most disturbing was that he had folds of skin all over his body. Imagine the Michelin man, but made of flesh. His face, his arms, his chest, everything had a uniform layer of shingled fat rolls. And he was brandishing a shotgun. The area around Wolf Creek is just holler after holler, but there are a few residences, and those few have been there for generations, propagated by the same families. These people don't like outsiders, and so they keep relations within the family. I could only surmise that this individual was the product of inbreeding over decades. He just stood there and watched as we scrambled to grab anything important and stuff it in a bag. He stood and watched as we hightailed it out of that basin and back toward the parking area and never said a word. I was backpacking through Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina with my dog. Just the two of us, and we were exploring the woods around Little Lost Cove. We were going open orienteering style, so we were not on an established trail. We'd been hiking throughout the day, following a crick, and toward the evening, I noticed my dog was acting abnormally. She was very much caught in a scent of something, and wouldn't ease up. This continued for about two hours before we made camp. That night in camp, she remained on edge and stared off into the wood line. I went about my camp business as usual, and then, at around midnight, I got this prickly feeling, like I was being watched intently. I felt the feeling ride for a little bit, and I kept tinkering with the fire. And then, I heard the brush rustle. I got up from the fire and shone my flashlight up the hillside. A figure on all fours just managed to escape the beam, all but the tail. It was a tail that I knew was not supposed to exist in the southern Appalachians. I cast my light again across the hillside, and this time I caught its eyes. Two glowing yellow orbs, just watching and waiting. At that point, I went into a fury, grabbed my tomahawk, and charged up the hill after the beast, screaming and cursing all the while. The watcher ran off, but neither I or the dog slept that night. The following morning, we left camp at first light and began hiking up the mountain to the ridgeline, which would lead us out. Atop the ridgeline in the fresh mud were a series of tracks. Tracks left by an animal that officially no longer exists in the eastern U.S. They were catamount tracks. They commonly go by cougars in the east, but we'd been stalked by a mountain lion just the same. Those tracks ran across the ridge, revealing that it had been watching and stalking us throughout the entire previous day as we hiked through the creek bed below. They weren't bobcat tracks, I know those. They were way too big, and so were the eyes I saw. I truly believe that if my dog hadn't given me some red flags, I would have been mauled that night. It remains one of my personal scariest experiences ever, and it just goes to show that sometimes, when you feel that something's creepy and off, it can be a lot scarier than a ghost. I work for a well-known university as a field biologist. 
and have recently been contracted out to the National Forest Service. My first assignment has been in the Potomac District of the Monongahela National Forest. Basically, I receive GPS coordinates and I either drive or hike to the designated spot and do whatever they want me to do. This could be setting up trail cameras or counters, monitoring equipment, doing trail surveys and the like, and then recording the data 24 hours after placement. No big deal. I thought it odd that they specifically requested I place the cameras only three feet off the ground and some of the infrared cameras in the trees at specified heights. Some of these locations are on designated trails but some are way off the trail in places that humans would never go. Sometimes there isn't a hotel or lodging close enough. These are the remote mountains in West Virginia. And the Forest Service has outfitted me in some pretty dank camping gear on the occasions I might have to camp. I am an experienced hiker and camper and have spent many nights alone out in the field due to my career choice. I'm a woman, about 5 foot 6 and 130 pounds, but I'm not really afraid of anything. Again, the Forest Service has outfitted me well, and I wear an emergency beacon that will send every law enforcement officer in the area to my location in no time. So, I've been assigned to this district for a few months now and have really enjoyed my work. West Virginia is very remote and unspoiled, and that's why I do what I do. I get to see things most people wouldn't, and I have had so many positive and almost spiritual moments, up until a few nights ago. I was working up near Spruce Knob, which is the highest point in West Virginia, and a complex system of trails, wilderness areas, camping, and so on. It's also been snowing, with howling winds and ice storms. I was camping up there to complete my work, and while the conditions were rough, I was almost enjoying it. My first night in the woods was pretty peaceful. I made dinner, set up camp, and drank some whiskey. I snuggled down in my sleeping bag and slept like a rock. It was very cold, but I wear this turtle fur face mask thing and didn't feel the cold too much. I woke up at dawn and went about building my fire back up and starting some coffee when I noticed all this churned up snow around my campsite. Not tracks, just churned up snow like someone or something had kicked it all around. Weird, but whatever. I had a 15 mile hike to set some cameras and didn't really have time to wonder about it. I set off on my hike, did what I had to do, and started back to camp. I never wear earbuds or anything because hearing is one of the most important senses in the wilderness. I want to be able to hear any animals or people before I see them. It was already past dark when I made it back to camp and I was too tired to do anything except strip down to my base layer, get into my sleeping bag, and pass out. At around 2 a.m. I woke up because I could hear people talking. People. I was 30 miles up a gravel road that was locked with forest service gates and around 10 miles from where my truck was parked and I could hear voices. I completely lost my shit. I have a firearm and I quietly retrieved it from my pack and got back into my sleeping bag, cocked it, and waited. I was on high alert, all my senses going wild. Eventually, the voices faded and I couldn't hear them anymore, but I never went back to sleep. At daylight, I emerged from my tent to more churned up snow, and my two trail cameras hanging from a tree about five feet from my tent. Cams I had placed 15 miles out from my campsite. I packed my shit as fast as I could and hauled ass back to my truck. Along the way, I saw a lot of human boot tracks all around my site. When I reached my truck, I discovered it had been broken into, and my computer and some other equipment had been stolen. I'm currently sitting in a luxury log cabin at some resort, too scared to retrieve my other equipment, and too embarrassed to tell my supervisors how scared I am. The Forest Service bought me a new truck while my other one is getting the window replaced, and I did make a report about the theft. 
that there is no way in hell I am ever going back to that site. I don't know if this means I'll be fired or sent to work at a desk, but out of all the years I've been doing this in the national forests all over the country, this is the most terrified I have ever been. I'm not scared of animals, and I have many stories to share about my encounters with them, but I am scared of people. This is my father-in-law's experience. This happened to him probably 10 years ago at our hunting camp in Alabama. It popped into my head as we're headed there tomorrow for a few days of deer hunting. He told me to go ahead and share his story. It's short, but as I get a little creeped out in the woods as it is, this would have freaked me out. So as some people probably know, you get out an hour or so before light and climb into a tree stand, a ladder leading up to a seat in a tree, usually fairly deep in the woods to hunt. This foggy morning, my father-in-law has been in his stand for a couple of hours, and it was getting light. He was reading a book as he waited for something to happen. Out of the fog, he hears a woman's voice, much closer than anyone should have been to him at the time. She's calling, Hunter, oh Hunter, in a very sing-songy voice almost like a mother calling her child in for dinner as he played outside. Now, as I said, he's pretty deep in the woods, and there are sticks and dried leaves everywhere. You generally make a pretty good racket getting to your stand, which is why you go out so early. Not only that, but in order to know where he was and spot him camouflaged in a tree, she must have seen his light when he walked out, followed him into the woods, and waited hours before calling to him. That's the only way she would have gone unnoticed. At first, he thought that the woman was calling someone named Hunter, maybe her son. She called again, and that's when he realized that he is the hunter. So he turns around, peers into the trees, and sees a young woman. She, in very few words and halting speech, explains that something is wrong with her hot water heater, and asks if he can come down and look. Now, the strangeness of the situation hadn't quite set in yet, and he's a give-you-the-shirt-off-his-back kind of guy, not to mention 6'2", nearing 300 pounds and carrying a gun, so he wasn't too worried about a small woman. He starts getting down the tree to go have a look. He follows her back to her mobile home, which borders our hunting land, probably a 10-minute walk. She walks inside and leaves the door open. He's trailing behind a little, so he gets to the door, kind of knocks, and sticks his head in to say hello. No answer. Where he entered is a laundry room, and he can see that there in the room is a hot water heater, and water is just pouring out of a valve at the bottom, just absolutely pouring out onto the floor. He walks over, turns off the valve, sticks his head in the house to say hello again, and nothing. No answer. The house seems completely empty. Empty of people, anyway, but it's a disaster inside. At this point, he's starting to see how strange it all is, and decides that this is just the sort of situation that gets you robbed and murdered. He nopes out of there and hurried back to our cabin. Now, we've hunted this land for years, and we've never seen anybody at this place, although until this season, it has shown obvious signs of being lived in. So, every time I pass her place, which backs right up to the road we take to our hunting stands, I always wonder about her. I'm not entirely sure if she's actually a real woman, or if maybe it was some ghost or something trying to get him to go there for a particular reason, but... It was a creepy experience, nonetheless. It's not unusual for me to trek out on solo hiking day trips. For context, I'm a 31-year-old female. I frequently visit the nearby provincial parks in Canada that are generally well used. It's rare that I end up on a hike not at least seeing one or two people. I grew up going on camping and hiking trips, 
and I feel very comfortable out in nature. I always inform people where I'm going and when I'm expected to be back. Safety first, right? One day last year, I was going stir crazy. So I took myself out to a popular nature educational center. A bunch of trails stem from this one spot. They're not long trails, but they are all interconnected, so it's easy to create your own distance. It was midweek, so I wasn't expecting to encounter many people, maybe a school group at most. I grab my backpack, lock the car, and head out. It was a beautifully sunny day, mid-autumn, so it was a little chilly out. I was listening to the sounds of nature surrounding me. Some squirrels, birds, even a deer crossed my trail at one point. I was sticking with the main trail, which had educational signs identifying the different types of plants as you went along. I have been trying to teach myself how to identify different trees on site, so this path was the best. I made my way up the first little hill, and then I made my way down the path, where it takes a sharp right turn. Up ahead, I caught sight of a man wearing a dark blue jacket. Strange, I hadn't seen any signs of the person or heard them, but whatever. Normally, I'm comforted seeing somebody else on the trail, but this time my gut instinct was not happy. I made a note of which way the person went and continued along. Blue Jacket had taken the path that I wanted to take to create a longer hike. It would have been a lot more secluded and less traveled. So for once, I tried to be smart, listen to my gut, and just follow the main route back to my car. Keep it short and safe. There would be other days for a long hike. I still had about two kilometers to get back to the parking lot. Clouds decided that they wanted to skirt across the sky, making the woods a little dull and ominous. I kept looking over my shoulder, feeling very unsettled. The trees cast finger-like shadows that did not help calm my imagination at all. One of my favorite spots on this main trail had a few huge boulders or rock formations right smack dab in the middle that you had to go around. Really neat for photos and climbing on a normal day. But today, they filled me with even more dread. I couldn't pinpoint why at first until I noticed some scuffs around the base of the rocks, going the wrong way around. The trail is very obvious which way to go, left, and these marks were to the right. It was like somebody walked around the rocks dragging their foot behind them. An animal? Maybe. I couldn't figure it out. I wanted to turn around and go back the way that I'd come, but that would have added another four kilometers to get back to the car. I stuck close to the far side of the real path, keeping a close eye on the rock formation. As I made it to the other side of the rocks, I caught sight of some blue fabric, the same blue jacket that I saw earlier. The person moved, as if ducking down between some rocks to avoid being seen. For blue jacket man to reach the rocks before me, he either cut his own path through the woods or sprinted through about five to six kilometers of trails. I didn't like the thought of either option, as I didn't know this person, and at this point, I didn't want to know them. Maybe he was taking a leak. Yeah, I'll go with that. I picked up my pace and dug my phone out. I texted my usual hiking friend, telling her all the details in case I went missing. Yes, I attempted to do this while following the path. I only walked into one tree. I glanced behind me again while the rocks were still in sight and I saw the man just standing there, looking at me. I ran the rest of the way back to my car, hopped in, and immediately locked the doors. Curiously, there wasn't a single other vehicle in the parking area or on the road nearby. This place was nowhere near any towns, so I have no clue where Blue Jacket came from. I took a couple of minutes to sort myself out in the car, and as I pulled out to leave, I looked at the trailhead. There was that damn blue jacket on the signpost I had just passed to get to my car, 
with nobody visible nearby. I was so spooked by this encounter that I refused to ever hike there alone again. Maybe it was all just an innocent misunderstanding, but it sure scared the hell out of me. In my college days, now 20 years ago, my friends and I often took off for the North Georgia mountains on the weekend. We wanted to smoke, drink, and commune with nature, and these mountains were perfect. On the weekend, this unsettling event occurred. Me, my friend Bill, and his German shepherd, Monty, headed out towards Sky Valley. It was the beginning of fall semester at UGA, and not much was going on yet. We had found an area where a dirt road led back a half a mile, and then we would hike in another mile or so and set up camp near a creek. Excellent trails were nearby with fun places to explore, not to mention flat ground, perfect for setting up camp. Bill and I arrived at our spot at around 4 p.m. and got a fire going. We were musicians. Bill's a guitar player and I'm a percussionist, so we started smoking and jamming. Around 10, after jamming for a while, we chatted about life and girls before tucking in for the night. It was a clear night, and so we just slept under the stars. It's important to note that we've never seen any sign of other people in this area during any of our other trips. At about two in the morning, I was awoken by Monty growling. It was a deep, guttural growl. Bill was still dead to the world, and I sat up to look around and listen, thinking that maybe an animal had come near our site. The fire was only embers at this point. I heard barely audible voices in the distance. Focusing on the area of the voices, I saw a faint red glow followed by another faint red glow to the left of the first. This was about a hundred yards away. My mind connected what I was seeing, cigarette embers burning, and they were getting closer. Bill, I whispered, wake up. Bill roused from his sleep and I explained what was going on. At this point, Monty started barking as the strangers approached camp. By the time we stood up, they were in the camp. Completely unfazed by the now rabid 70-pound German Shepherd, two incredibly unkempt late 30s, early 40s deliverance types walked up on us. Bill told Monty to calm down. I will never forget the look of these guys. Skinny as hell, about 5'8", shirts caked in grime, mangy beards, and probably five teeth between the two of them. Each had huge knives attached to their belt buckles. What you boys doing way out here? Look like you having a good time. We responded and told them that we'd been out there to camp and drink some beer. They asked if we had any weed and we gave them a joint. They looked around a bit and asked if we wanted to smoke with them. We declined, saying that we were heading out early. Throughout the conversation, anything Bill or I said, they looked at each other before responding. Finally, before they left... One of them hesitated for a moment and said, Y'all stay safe. Never know who you could run into out here. Followed by a laugh as they walked away. We packed up early and left. While this isn't as creepy as some other stories I've heard, these guys were the epitome of a backwood redneck. The fact that we only awoke because of the dog still sketches me out to this day. About 15 years ago, I lived in Sulphur, Oklahoma. My playground? The Chickasaw National Recreation Area. I loved that park so much. I rode more miles on my bike there than anywhere else. I've walked nearly every trail and ridden nearly every road. Every day, I would ride my mountain bike up and down the trails and would be home by nightfall most days. One night, however, I had ridden out a bit further than usual. On my way back, however, I decided to ride the trail from an area known as Buffalo Springs. As the name suggests, they have live buffalo roaming and there's a large spring and fountain for all to enjoy. As I was riding back, I knew the end of the trail was coming up, and I would have to cross a stone bridge across the creek and then up the road to my home. 
It was dark at this time, and all I had to see by was the full moon. I was maybe a few hundred yards from it when I got a sharp pain in my left thigh. I stopped and looked around to see what had just hit me. Then I heard a noise sounding like something hitting the ground hard in front of me. There was a rock, about the size of a baseball, rolling across the trail. Me, being confused, I looked up the side of the hill. Just as I turn to look, I almost fall off my bike when another rock comes flying down, hitting my front wheel. I finally get my eyes to adjust to look and see someone very tall and dark and covered in hair at the top of the hill, throwing things at me and screaming. I yelled that I had a cell phone and was going to call the police. I didn't actually have one as I didn't have a cell phone yet. This seemed to have pissed him off. He started charging down the hill at me. For obvious reasons, I lit up my bike and took off. Just as I crossed the bridge, I heard a huge splashing noise in the creek. I saw that it was a huge rock that had been thrown. I was in the clear to home, but was frightened all the way there. I went to the ranger station later the next morning and told a ranger I knew there about what happened. He said, So you're telling me you were attacked by Bigfoot? He started snidely laughing. I said, Listen, I don't know what it was, but something was trying to hurt me out there. The ranger just laughed. Okay, Justin, if we have any more Bigfoot, I'll let you know what we get. I said fine and left. The very next week, I was riding in the daylight when the park ranger pulled up next to me and told me to get in. I asked him why, and he said he needed to show me something. We headed to the police department in town. Before we got out of the car, he turns to me and says, Justin, I owe you a huge apology. I'll be honest, I didn't believe you when you told me the story of how you were attacked, but it's come to my attention that a couple was out in the same area last night, and they were attacked in the same way, saying they had seen a large hairy creature throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at them. They called the police and they came out with some of the other rangers, myself included. I immediately thought about what you told me. When we arrived and started up the hill, sure enough, we were having rocks and things thrown at us. Guns drawn and yelling, two officers tackled a man to the ground. He was six foot five, naked, covered in mud, had long hair and a large beard. Turns out he had escaped from the Veterans Center across Veterans Lake. Apparently, in his mind, he thought he was back in Vietnam, and he was trying to, quote, take out the enemy. The park ranger said that I was very lucky, because while he wasn't Bigfoot, he was trying to kill me. We went inside so I could give the police my statements as to what had happened. They had to send him somewhere to a more secure facility, and... To this day, I still get shivers when I hike that trail, and I always keep my eyes on the ridge top. I definitely feel bad for the guy. That was also one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in the backwoods. I live in the suburbs of Dublin, Ireland, where I'm surrounded by greenery, beautiful hiking trails, and lots of Celtic mysticism. One particular hiking trail is called the Hellfire Club. There's a lot of stories that have been passed on from generation to generation as to where it got the name. But the most popular, as far as I'm aware, is that on top of the mountain where the trail passes is an old, completely deteriorated stone house. Legend has it that back in the day, it was a hangout spot where men would drink, play cards, and have a merry old time. One night, a group of men were playing cards, and a stranger asked if he could join in. During the game, one of the men dropped a card, bent down to pick it up off the ground, and realized the stranger that had joined them had hoofed feet. So, present day, this trail is very popular for hikers and campers. This particular day, three friends decided to go camping and set up tent beside an old hunting lodge. 
After a few hours, they noticed that someone had set up camp quite close by. Not weird, but maybe a little odd. This guy decided to approach the three campers and introduce himself, and ended up chatting with them for a few hours. After some time had passed, one of the campers decided that they needed more firewood. The stranger went with him and the other two went off in another direction. As the camper was about to get firewood, he was grabbed from behind by the stranger, who put his left hand across his mouth and attempted to cut his throat with the knife. He was sliced across the throat three times before he managed to push the attacker away. He fell to the ground and was then stabbed in the chest. The knife broke, leaving the blade embedded in his chest. The other two realized something was happening and tried to intervene, one being knocked to the ground and the other escaping to go get help. The cops were called and went searching for the guy who they eventually found. It turned out that he had recently spent a lot of time in a mental institution, suffered from a deep-seated mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia, and he had had an acute psychotic episode that day. As far as I know, he got locked up for a few years, but this happened about ten minutes away from my house. Horror movies come to life. I don't know if these two events are connected, but people say the Hellfire Club in that area, which also happens to be where these people were camping, is cursed. The scariest story I have is about a night deep in the Oregon woods. I'll preface this by giving my background, not as a brag or anything, just to show that my outdoor and survival bona fides are there. I'm 37, and I've literally spent over five total years alone in the woods, camping and hiking. I've gone months without ever talking to another human being. I've taken every class or training you can imagine in identifying animals, especially threatening ones that can kill me. I have walked most of the Appalachian Trail barefoot. I've spent three weeks in varying wilderness areas across the U.S. and Canada. I know what a mountain lion sounds like, whether it's mating, scared, communicating, or whatever. I know what foxes, bobcats, owls, and varying birds, moose, elk, deer, weasels, bison, bugs, everything in between sounds like. When you have a hobby like I do, and you spend every free second alone in the woods, you have to know sounds. It's absolutely imperative to know if something is close by that wants to eat you. Again, I only say all this because it's inevitable. Every time I tell one of my stories, at least one person is going to say, Nah, dude, it's just a fox. They scream bloody murder. Yeah, I know. I've had three or four sounds that scared me that don't match any animal living in North America. There was only one that made me leave camp early and go back to civilization. This time, I was actually doing a buddy camp with my oldest friend. He's the same age and has more experience in the woods than I do. We met up in Oregon for a two-week camp in the vicinity of Mount Hood National Park. We were well off the beaten path, no people or civilization anywhere near us. One night, late at our camp setup, he and I were sitting by a fire, just bullshitting and reminiscing. It's also important to note that we were sober. I occasionally drink and occasionally smoke, but never on these trips. Your sobriety and level-headedness can be the difference between life and death out there. As we talked from maybe 300 yards away or so, down in a ravine, we heard a howl, growl, scream sound that persisted for several minutes. It literally vibrated in our heads. That's how powerful it was. It was guttural. And booming. The only way I've ever been able to describe it is if you imagine a huge horror movie with a limitless budget. Imagine some huge powerful demon. Now imagine in that movie the demon is somehow defeated and sent back to hell and the screams of agony and anger as it's dragged back to where it came from. That's what it sounded like. It was terrible. Two grown men with decades of experience both of us carrying firearms for protection. Firearms that, if need be, could take down a thousand pound bear. We're in hysteric tears, clinging to each other like a Scooby-Doo movie, frantically deciding what to do. 
We made it until the first signs of day and booked our asses back to our checkpoint and got the hell out of not just the area, but Oregon completely. I'm now just getting to the point that I can talk about it. I've never gone out there to monster hunt. It's always been about my love of nature, animals, and solitude. Over the last few months, I've become enthralled with unknown sounds because of my own experience. I've never gone out with any technology except a mobile GPS and an emergency satellite phone. My next trip is in May. I have recently invested in solid recording equipment, an FLIR camera, and a solid digital video recorder. On this next trip, I'm going to actively devote time to try to record the things that I've heard. I'm not sure what the hell I saw on this day. I'm pretty sure this incident can be debunked, but I would need to go back and investigate for more of a definite answer. In March of 2018, my friends and I needed to shoot for a music video project for film class. I was running about an hour late because I was involved with a community play. When I came to the park, they told me that some weird kids were following them around when they started filming. We were filming ourselves smashing fruit, because why not? They had to be at least one year or two years older than us. I don't remember if I ever saw them in person, but they were able to get in the background of some of our footage. I remember them looking like hicks as we were filming in the mountains. There was obviously something off about them. We then continued filming. Two hours passed and the sun was setting. We had just wrapped filming for the day and were headed back to the pavilion. The park is set up where there is a pavilion near the playground. Near this playground and pavilion, there's a walking trail that goes through a wooded area, which takes up about an acre. You come out near a few soccer fields and loop around back to the parking lot, which is also near the pavilion and playground. We were primarily left alone in the park after those kids left, with occasional people popping up every now and then. An old lady was walking her dog near the pavilion, and my friends decided to talk to her. I was putting our equipment away when I saw a girl off the walking path in the wooded area. She was wearing a modern-day white winter jacket, Ugg boots, and a white winter hat and black pants. She had brown or black hair. She looked about my age. I was wondering if it was somebody I went to school with, so I tried to see her face, but she wouldn't turn around. I forgot if she was walking a dog or if she was just standing there by herself. She was off the path and didn't seem to be going in a straight direction. Rather, she was walking around slowly, in a circle. All of a sudden, she slowly goes behind a tree and doesn't come out the other side. At this point, my friends were done talking to the old lady and they were leaving. They left before me, as they lived closer to the park than I did. After they left, I investigated and didn't see the girl. I brought this up with my friends later, and they said that besides the kids mentioned earlier, they hadn't noticed anybody. A few months later, I went back to investigate more. There was a white bench in the area where I had seen the girl. Depending on where you sat at the pavilion depended on how much of the bench you could see. It was also very cold out when I was at the park the time I saw the girl. It was one of the hotter days of the month, but when the sun sets, it's nearly freezing temperatures. I was wearing a short-sleeved shirt since it was supposed to be hotter than usual out. The cold could have made me hallucinate, I guess, as I'm pretty sure I could have gotten frostbite if I stayed out there another half hour. The girl also could have just walked out from behind the tree when I wasn't paying attention. I also found an entrance to a bunker or something in the wooded area. It didn't look like a regular electrical or sewer entrance either, as it was painted blue and had some sort of message on it. I don't remember what it said, but it was definitely not related to the sewer or electricity. Maybe the bunker is haunted. The only thing creepy I could find out about the park is that a vigil was held there for a girl who was hit by a car in a nearby town a few years prior to filming. I didn't get any footage of her, unfortunately, but I'm not the type of person to make these kinds of stories up. I am planning on going back to this park to see if I can debunk this once and for all.
So back in Halloween of the early 2000s, my friends and I were trick-or-treating as we were only in our freshman or sophomore years of high school. We had taken a walk to a wealthier neighborhood in the hopes that they would have better candy than ours did, and we were supposed to cut through a slightly wooded area into a friend's backyard. My friend Will was leading us through, and he didn't really know the shortcut back, so we ended up in a very small clearing, just barely still visible from the street. We could still see the street, though, so we didn't end up getting lost. The point, though, is the house that we found. It was slightly old and definitely abandoned, with all of the overgrowth covering it, making it hard to see from the street. We wanted to check it out, as it was Halloween, and we figured we should get a little spooked. We did get spooked, too, when we peeked through the back screen door and saw a little bit of movement in the pitch-black house. But we were already slightly creeped out, so we decided to walk back and take the right shortcut. As we went back, we saw a little bit of movement behind us, and all of us booked it home, being as excitable as we already were. This all happened five months before the actual point of the story occurred. By this time, we had explored the house sealing off the first floor with a door, shower curtain, and weights, as there was some kind of substance in the air that would always make us feel unwell. We made a setup out of the upper floor of the house that we could relax in. We were using it as a spot to hang out, having filled it with battery lamps and chairs as well as sleeping bags, for when we would have get-togethers away from our parents for a long time. But as cozy as we made it, the things that we found in the house creeped us out endlessly. The ones I remember the most were the two closets, one with a hook and a rope on the ceiling, and possibly dried blood on the ground. The other closet was filled with plastic on the walls and what we think was also blood. New cleaning supplies were still under the kitchen sink, even though the faucet was removed as well as the oven. There was a functional cotton gin sitting in the empty garage, and a grime-covered knife sitting in the sink. We ignored most of these things, and simply sealed off more rooms that creeped us out. But when we found that knife in the sink, I was worried somebody could use it to attack one of us if they somehow ended up squatting in the hideout we made. So I got the genius idea of going to the absolutely filthy brown and black fluid leaking out of the walls bathroom that no one would ever think to go in, and throw the knife in the toilet, which was filled with the same grime and sludge. But when I went in, I failed to notice the door, for some reason, ever so gently closing behind me. And as I was looking around the bathroom for a place to hide the knife, the room got thick and cold, except for a slight warmth on my left shoulder, and I was paralyzed. That moment started to feel like hours. Then, ever so quietly, and weakly, and tiredly, I heard a noise in my left ear, like something that's a cross between a whimper and a dry-throated croak. It seemed filled with more sadness and panic and pleading than I've ever felt in my entire life. I quickly ran out, tossing the knife behind me, and slammed the door shut as hard as I could, feeling a force pull back against me. Then I ran out to my friends, who were just outside by the door. We sealed that room up too, and we only went back to clean out our things. We called the police anonymously, and the house was searched, and a few months later it was demolished. I'd like to say that although the police searched and apparently found nothing, I concretely believe that a woman, or maybe some poor girl, died in that house. I hope she isn't angry with me. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area, as well as many historical figures such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, 
Vlad the Impaler, and others. They were all once residing here and fighting battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World Wars had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak magic, or Vlaska magia, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorites was a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest, in a small and old house that was about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if it was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits the house and stays overnight here. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be here. I can't imagine staying here overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very weird story. While he stays there, he gets visited often. At first, I thought visits like the one you get from neighbors or something. But he told me that one night he woke up to a hand crawling on his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him, using his hand to just crawl across his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair, and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time he told me that he used to fix small parts around his house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave with his tractor because it takes about an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around locked the barn, and didn't so much as frown. They expect you to react. Do not give them this pleasure, is what he told me while laughing. It makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really runs in our family, experiencing from time to time such encounters. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual stories from the past, how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. Since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motorcycle and drove out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about things, you know? to be in this type of state that you don't have to question everything and think about the world. So one day I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I find myself driving to the old house he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. 
I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are very widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dusk, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared, so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought that I was invincible. In fact, even a vampire wouldn't cross my path, that I would ease past with him to no harm. There aren't really any streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to pretty much nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road starts to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. I thought maybe it was a bug, that I had squished it, but it was just too much blood. So I started to look at my hand for wounds, but my hand seemed to be perfectly fine. My heart slowly started racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my entire life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It seemed like somebody was sitting behind me, just waiting for me to fall down or make a mistake. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. I have a ton of stories regarding these kinds of events. Also, we have a few witches in our family that used to practice black magic. It was taught to them by their ancestors. I haven't really had a ton of encounters that I can't explain, but one kind of sticks with me from about a year ago. Last December, I was visiting my family who lives in Poland for the holidays. Just some traditional stuff. A couple of days before Christmas, I decided to take a walk in the forest that I used to play in when I was little. There wasn't much going on for the rest of that particular day. It was in the late afternoon, and it was pretty foggy, with overcast skies. The temperature was around 5 degrees Celsius. When I entered the forest, it was normal. I could hear birds chirping and other small animals moving around. About 15 minutes later, it suddenly got really cold. The forest went quiet, and I could see my own breath. I was confused, so I checked the weather app on my phone to see if the temperatures matched up. But my phone said it was still 5 degrees, which didn't make any sense, because I could see my breath and my teeth were chattering. Then, when I turned my phone off, I saw my reflection in the screen but standing behind me was a white figure. I didn't get a great look before I jumped and quickly turned around to find nothing behind me. It scared the shit out of me, so I started running back the way I came. As I ran, I looked back to see the figure calmly walking toward me. Only then did I get a good look at her. It looked like a girl, probably in her late teens or early twenties. She had mid-length, curly, dark hair, and wore a dress that looked like it was from the early 1900s era. It didn't look like she had any eyes, just dark holes where the eyes should have been. This scared me even more, so I picked up my pace and ran full speed out of the woods and back to my uncle's house. As I exited the forest, I felt the temperature gradually return to normal. When I entered the house, I was out of breath. None of my family members were home except for my aunt, who was in the other room watching television. I never told them, or anyone, about what happened. I've tried finding a logical explanation for it all, but I just can't. I was always skeptical about ghosts, but I am a superstitious person, especially when it comes to demons or folklore. If anyone knows more about the paranormal than I do, and you know what the hell that thing was, please let me know.
My husband and I really enjoy outdoor sports, especially camping. We sometimes go camping in forbidden zones, too. But we really do take care of the place we're staying, always cleaning up our mess and trying to leave it the way we found it. This happened during one of the times we were camping in a forbidden zone. We now call it the Fairy Forest. The forest is owned by a family that did a hell of a good job at decorating the place. Figures of fairies, elves, and angels were scattered around the brown fall leaves on branches and rocks. Dream catchers and other handmade artifacts, presumably made by children, were also hanging around the place. There were also little tables and chairs designed for the fairies and info tables explaining about the fairies and elves. It was truly a fairy tale. There was one problem, though. Some douchebags threw things and broke some of the decorations. So we put them back up and mended what we could, and then we walked along. We set up our tent, cooked some food, enjoyed our drinks, and just chilled before going to bed. I woke up to three or four lights hovering over me at night. I wasn't scared, I was just surprised. I didn't want to open my eyes in case the lights disappeared. I wanted to prolong the experience as much as I could, but I soon drifted back to sleep. The morning sun penetrating our tent woke us up. As we were pouring our morning coffee, I casually told my husband that I saw lights hovering over us at night. He paused for a second and then said, I saw them too. We got into a heated discussion as to what they could have been. No, our overhead lamp could not have malfunctioned, because the lights were moving, almost swimming in the air, if you will. No, they could not have been people shining flashlights at us, because we didn't hear any footsteps, and the source of the lights were coming directly from our tent right above us. They were like balls of light, or orbs, not like rays. No, they couldn't have been airplane lights or any other street lights, because again, the lights that we saw were moving. We believe that they were fairies, possibly thanking us for cleaning up the mess. We still go there from time to time, just to drink coffee, but we haven't camped there since. I always sense this amazing feeling each time I go there. That forest melts away my problems and gives me a content feeling almost like it's telling me that everything's going to be okay. And it's absolutely beautiful. My stepdad and I are pretty cool. He's been in the family for about two years now, and he's told me a few stories that I'll always remember. This is one of them. He's a hunter, and he's always hunted with his family and friends from church. One weekend, he and some guys from church were hunting rabbits using dogs. While they were in the woods, they passed an abandoned barn, probably because there was a farm not far away. They kept going through some thick brush until it opened up to a less thick forest. In the trees, there were what seemed to be squirrel nests, but these were different. They were big enough for a person to lie down in. When they got here, the hunting dogs started barking and ran to the trees that held the nests, as if there was some kind of animal up there. My stepdad and the other men grabbed the dogs and kept walking, because they figured it was just raccoons, and they were only after rabbits. They kept combing the woods, and the dogs jumped one rabbit, which one of the men shot. After he shot it, however, one of the shells failed to eject, so he went back to the truck to fix the gun. As the rest were hunting, they heard a shot coming from the direction of the truck. They walked back, thinking that he had shot another rabbit. When they started on their way back to the truck, they met the man walking through the woods to meet them. He told them that he had fixed his gun and sat down to eat some crackers that he had bought at a gas station before the hunt. As he was eating, the shotgun went off even though it was just a couple of feet away, laying on the bed of the truck. He also added that he clearly remembered the gun being on safety. After that incident, they quit the hunt. 
Before they left, one man brought up that he felt weird the whole time they were hunting, as if somebody was watching them. The others said that they felt the same way, especially after they encountered the nests in the trees. My stepdad told me about where it was they were hunting, and I've been by there before. What I can see from the road is thick, thick forest that's almost in the middle of nowhere, with that one farm and a cotton field. It makes me scared to go hunting by myself. This was back in June of 2016. My mom and dad had taken a trip out west. They had entered Muir Woods and were not very far in, no more than half a mile. Of course, they're both admiring the huge trees, taking it all in, snapping photos and basking in the general magnificence of the towering woods. So my mom says that both she and my dad are standing in front of this one huge tree, there are tourists bopping around close by, feet away. As she's looking, she notices this movement coming from the bark. I ask her how high up, and she says it was at approximately eye level, so four and a half to five feet. My mom is short, five foot nothing. She said all of this happened in the span of about five seconds. Movement in the bark directly in front of her, and then she sees it take the shape of a face. First the brows, then a nose, eyes, lips, and chin. She says the face is protruding out of the trunk. I ask how big this face is, and she says almost a foot tall from chin to forehead. As the face is continuing to bulge, she lets out a small, involuntary gasp. And just like that, as if the face realized it was being noticed, it shrunk back into the bark, and the tree returned to normal. Not looking away from the tree, my mom says, Kelly, did you see? And my father completes her sentence with, the face in the tree, yes. Not a question, it was a statement. Another woman, who was a couple of feet away, stepped up to where my parents were standing and said, I saw it too, and then moved away. Now, either the majority of the group was already moving out, or my father just began walking away on his own accord, but they both leave the tree. Mom said she started asking my dad about what he saw to see if it matched what she did. He said he wasn't comfortable discussing it right then and told her to hush, that if people heard them they would think they were crazy. So, they leave it alone. But later during the trip, he still doesn't want to discuss it. Now, even though my dad has had his fair share of wild experiences, and he will usually humor bizarre conversation, he's handled this whole situation like a total Hank Hill. Maybe since he can't fully understand it, he rebukes it. I don't know. He's always been particularly sensitive on the topic of the paranormal. He almost rejects it, but I know he believes in it enough that he's afraid of giving it power by acknowledging it. Like he knows giving it a thought is the same thing as giving it energy and room to grow. I feel like I know this because I bought my mom dousing rods once. She didn't think I could find them. This was ten years ago when she didn't understand the vastness of Amazon shopping capabilities. I took it as both a challenge and a Christmas gag gift. My dad went into town and the rest of the family started playing with the rods, asking it questions. My dad walked in the door, saw the rods, and said, I don't want those in this house. He was pissed. He equated them to a Ouija board, which was absolutely off limits in our house. To this day, my mom has so many questions. What did she see in that tree? What would it have done if it hadn't been seen? Was it an entity from another plane? Has this phenomenon ever been mentioned in near woods? I don't know, but it certainly was an interesting experience to hear about. I went to Moonville when I was in college in Nelsonville. We decided at around 10 p.m., let's go search for this supposedly haunted tunnel. We arrived at about 10.45 p.m. Unaware of the parking lot and the bridge that led right to it, 
We parked a few miles down the road from it, on an old railroad track that's now a path. Our friend promised that he knew the way from there. We followed the walking path that just stops at a very steep embankment, almost 90 degrees. We all climb down and then come to Raccoon Creek and cross a shallow part. We wander around for a bit, roughly until midnight, trying to find this tunnel and anything particularly paranormal or out of the ordinary. All of a sudden, we're in this canyon-type thing, and everything in the middle of it is dead. Trees, birds, insects, nothing was living, and there were animal corpses that covered the canyon floor. One end of the cliff was about 35 feet down, so I'm not sure what was there. When we found our way out of the canyon, it was like we had just exited a completely different world. Everything was living again, and you could hear birds. Thinking to ourselves that we thought we had only spent about 30 minutes in there, we checked our phones. Our phones were doubling as our flashlights, and all of them were almost dead. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. Knowing that this was the witching hour, we all started to freak out a bit, and knowing that there were cults and sacrificial rituals that were performed in those woods often, we wanted to get out of there. We didn't know where we were, and we were trying to use our maps on our phones, but we didn't have any service, so that wasn't a lot of help. And then, our phones started to die, one by one, until we got to the last bit of battery on the last phone. That was when we found the one-lane gravel road, and instantly were able to run out and find our vehicles and get the hell out of there. Since then, I've only been back once, and it was in the daytime, after finding out about the bridge to it. Definitely one of the creepier experiences I've ever had, and I haven't ventured back to that spot from the first night, and I don't plan to again. Another interesting note is that it's said that a goat man lives on top of the tunnel, although I've never had any encounter to prove this, but I thought maybe it was worth a mention. I'm a bow hunter, and I still like to hunt, but something that happened to me last October makes me never want to hunt again. I was coming down a hill into a marshy area it was kind of late, and the side of the mountain was covered in shadows. I live in Pennsylvania, where our mountains are completely covered in trees, and it gets dark fast. When I went to the bottom of the hill, I noticed that it was completely silent, no sounds at all, and I felt the hairs stand up on my arms. But I've been creeped out before in the woods, so it wasn't too much of a big deal. I kept on. I've been hunting in this general area before, but I'd never gone down this particular hill. I continued creeping through the woods. Mind you, I'm walking very slowly, so you can barely hear my footsteps. Deer are hard to sneak up on. Then I hear a voice call out from behind me from a small thicket of trees. Help! And then my name. Come over here. I'm in trouble. Help! I swear it sounded just like my brother's voice, and I almost ran to it. But then I realized my brother lives in Nevada. There's no way it could be him. The second thing that creeped me out in that moment was that this thing said my name. It only took me a second to realize that something wasn't right. And when I did, I ran faster than I ever have in my life. Only my dad knew where I was hunting that day. And the area is so huge that nobody would have found me out there, and he's too old to have played any tricks on me like that. But something out there knew my name, and it sounded just like my brother. I don't know what the hell that was, but I don't think I'll ever be going back into the woods again. Maybe I'll move to the desert with my brother, where at least I can see everything around me. I didn't realize this before yesterday, but I might have experienced something paranormal on a camping trip. I realized it because I was reading a story online about a hunter that heard the voice of his brother in the woods. 
As I scrolled through the comments, I became familiar with some cultural stories about creatures that can lure us basically to our death. Well, last year, we went camping with some friends. It was early September, but still hot enough to sleep outside. We made ourselves a lovely camping spot with a big bonfire and some candles around it. I have some psychic abilities and can feel if a spirit is near or something. Usually I can sense if it's a female or masculine or if it's a child presence. Sometimes I thought I could feel something, but I didn't want to think too much about it. I didn't want to get scared and fall into paranoia. The evening went fine and we stayed up until about 1 to 2 in the morning before going to bed. I woke an hour or two later in full mode panic attack. I have a history with anxiety, but I've never felt that kind of nausea before. It was like everything that I experienced before when I had my moments of high anxiety, but multiplied. I was sleeping with my boyfriend in the tent, and he asked if I was okay. I told him that I was feeling very bad and probably having a little panic attack, which had never happened to me before in that setting. I assumed it was just because we were laying on the ground and it wasn't very comfortable, and maybe I had gotten uneasy during my sleep. So I sat up and started doing some breathing exercises to calm me down. It didn't really work, and I ended up having to leave the tent to throw up. After that, it kind of got better, and I was eventually able to fall back asleep a while later. The next morning, we all woke up and started packing up our stuff. I told the others about my story, and my boyfriend and one of his friends started talking about how they heard footsteps around our camp during the night. I didn't think much of it, since I didn't hear it, but according to my boyfriend, it happened just before I woke up, and that's why he asked me if I was okay, because he was already awake, listening to the footsteps when I woke up panicking. Fast forward to today, I never really thought about this incident much. I thought it was just an episode of panic that was brought on by the fact that I pushed my body a little too hard that day when we went on a long hike. But now that I've read all these stories about all of these creatures, and I remembered that I sensed something early on, and given that my boyfriend and his friends heard footsteps, I wonder if I woke up that night feeling the intense danger that was around us. One year, when I was about 15, I went to a scout camp at Bear Lake in Idaho. I haven't forgotten about it since. To this day, I believe I saw a dragon. The whole week we were there, it had been mostly sunny and warm. But one day, it got really cloudy and stormy. It started out as a drizzle during the day, but quickly turned into a torrential downpour at night. The camping site that our troop was assigned to was right on the bank of the lake, toward the south end. Anyway, I woke up in the middle of the night. It was pitch black, and the wind was howling like a chorus of upset toddlers. The reason I woke up? I had to pee like crazy. So we have this buddy rule that if you go anywhere, you have to bring your assigned buddy with you. Especially at night. It didn't get the name Bear Lake for nothing, after all. So I wake up my buddy and tell him I need to pee. He groggily says, are you freaking serious? When he saw me wriggling like a madman, he got out of his sleeping bag and grabbed his flashlight and jacket. We get our boots on and unzip the tent. Instantly, we're drenched. We start walking toward the outhouse, when about midway there, we hear this loud-ass roar. Thinking it was a bear, we started to panic. We turned around, but couldn't see anything with our flashlights. Suddenly, a flash of lightning illuminates the sky, and we see this creature with a massive wingspan, a long neck, and a spiked tail. As it flew over us, we could see the silhouette of it, its wings in a downbeat. As it passes, the air from the downbeat literally pushed us into the mud. Terrified, we run back to the tent and hide. Needless to say, I completely forgot about having to pee until the next morning. To this day, my friend and I still talk about what we saw, and we both agree that it was a dragon.
This happened a long time ago. I was 12 and in my grandparents' village. We had a cow and an ox. Usually the son of the bull, usually just one, took all the cattle to graze and at night he would take them back. Cows know where to go when they're going home. My grandpa had a male ox and since my father was an adult and he wasn't there, I took the responsibility. Basically, my job was to go around the village with the ox trailing after me, calling the people to open their doors. Our ox would grunt to call the herd, and all the females came out. From then on, I had to take them to a clearing up in the mountains, and then later take them to the river. It was easy. The animals already knew where they were going. They were calm, and our bull was a gentle giant. All I did was ride him, and I had a thin rope on his horns. If any of the females wandered off, all I had to do was call, or, on rare occasions, poke her with a dull stick in the right direction. My grandpa said that if I saw a wolf, a boar, or a fox, I should stay on the ox. Not many animals would dare go near an ox herd. There's a dark part of the forest where it's very quiet and even the bravest hunters won't go there. It's very slippery and dangerous. They said that even the deer and boar dare not go there. I was forbidden to go there, and honestly, I never wanted to. It was an early morning and everything seemed fine. I was on the ox going up the mountain, and I was glad that he let me because it was hard to trek up. I saw that one of the females was wandering off. I followed her and left our ox and the dogs to guide the herd. She went into the forest. I ran to her and got on tying the rope onto her horns. I tried steering her away, but she continued. She went into the dark part and stopped. I didn't want to get off in case she ran back and left me there. I heard a crunch and turned around. A very old man was walking toward us. He looked frail with dirty clothes and a long beard. I was scared, so I laid on the ox, clinging to her, not wanting to fall off if she ran. Oxen aren't like bulls. They don't jump and kick when they're scared. They either attack with their horns and trample, or run. I was ready to hold on no matter what she chose to do. Our oxen don't take kindly to strangers. Before I took them out, I had to go to every house and have the ox owner introduce me to the animal. That way, they saw that their owner trusts me, and their herd leader, our ox, trusts me too. I knew that she would either attack or bolt, but she just stood there. The stranger came to us and petted her on the head, whispering something I didn't understand. He looked up at me, and his eyes were completely white. Then he turned around and left, just disappearing into the trees. Suddenly the female grunted as if she had just woken up or come out of a trance. Our male does that noise every morning, and then she bolted the way we'd come from. We found the herd. I quickly got on our ox and yelled water. He knew that command and went down toward the river. There were houses there, and it was closer than home. I barged in to one of the houses and tried to explain. The couple there stayed with me and sent their daughter to call my grandpa. I couldn't sleep for days, remembering those whited-out eyes. My grandparents didn't let me out of the house or garden, and I wasn't allowed near trees. Later, I learned that they were protecting me from a lesnick a forest spirit which can take the form of a man, an owl, or a wolf. It hates when people go into his part of the woods and can kidnap you. I later learned that the ox which took me there had fallen ill and died. It sometimes stays in the trees as an owl, looking for the offender. For years, when I went to my grandparents, they wouldn't let me be alone. Not just outside, but inside too. All I know is that I'm never going into those woods again.
The following happened in a nearby woods when I was in 7th or 8th grade, which was the late 1980s. And to this day, I have no idea what it was or why it happened. I'll preface this story by saying that, although I was fairly young when it took place, I had literally grown up in the middle of a forest and spent just about every free moment out among the trees. I never had any fear of nature, and by the time I was in middle school, I was already a pretty competent hunter and tracker, and could identify just about any animal by its tracks, sounds, or scat. I had had close-up encounters with groundhogs, raccoons, deer, and even coyotes and great horned owls, which is why whatever my friend and I encountered that day confuses me. I was at my friend Roger's house, also a burgeoning outdoorsman. One afternoon we decided to walk to a small woods maybe a quarter mile from his house, just to check it out. I think it must have been late fall or early spring, because the trees were barren, the ground was muddy, and it was chilly outside, around 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. We weren't looking for anything, it was just something to do. So we walk over, enter the woods, and just start walking around, talking and looking at the trees and the occasional bits of trash that people had left behind. Eventually, we wander apart from each other by maybe 30 yards. There's not much overgrowth, so we can still see each other. It was about this time that I started getting that being watched feeling. A second later, out of the corner of my eye, I catch a glimpse of a white flash four or five feet off the ground. It seemed to come from or dodge behind one of the trees. It wasn't light, exactly, but more like a very white object of undefinable shape and size. I looked around for a minute, but never did see anything else, and figured that it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. So, I went back to exploring, but then it happened again, and I still couldn't see anything when I looked around more directly. After a few seconds, The flash or white object seemed to appear and disappear among the trees in different directions. One time it would be off to my left. Then, just a few seconds later, it would be to my right, or just behind me. I was a little freaked out, but mostly just really curious as to what was happening. This went on for maybe three to four minutes. Right about then... I noticed that Roger was standing next to me, looking pale and shaken up. I think we should go back now, he said. I have to admit I was a little disappointed, but I had never seen him look or act quite that way before. Usually the kid wasn't afraid of anything and was a little bit of a troublemaker. So we trudged out of the woods and back onto the little gravel road that ran to it and headed back toward his house. Roger didn't say a word the whole way back. When we finally got back to his house, we went to get a snack, and as we were standing in the kitchen, I briefly asked him, So, out there, did you see some kind of white thing? Because I kept... Almost immediately he cut me off. Yeah, and I don't want to ever talk about it. Again, it was a response that was very out of character for my normally tough-talking friend. A couple of years later, he, I, and another friend would be on a late-night walk, get mistaken for burglars, and have a gun pulled on us. Even after being threatened with a firearm, he was never this quiet or freaked out. I dropped it, and I hadn't asked him about it since. I still see Roger occasionally, But we've never talked about that day again, and in decades of rambling around every sort of woods that I can find, I've never encountered anything like that again. Nothing has ever felt or looked like that. No bird, bear, mountain lion, or anything else. Not even people. I have no idea what we saw that day, but I hope somebody does, because it haunts me still today.
I was probably around 10 years old when this happened. My dad and I were driving down the road one afternoon in Columbus, Ohio. I remember looking out the window and seeing a large plane flying really low. If memory serves me right, it appeared really old and was maybe a military plane. We do have an Air Force base that's not far, so that would make sense. I remember being fascinated by the plane and excitedly pointing it out to my dad. He continued to drive while occasionally peeking over to look at it. After a few moments, the plane started to aggressively swerve like the pilot was losing control. Not long after, it nosedived and flew into a patch of nearby trees. I remember my dad panicking and pulling his truck over to the side of the road. We just sat there and looked out the window, but there was nothing. There was no sound of any kind, no smoke or fire, nothing. The trees didn't rustle and everything was calm. We waited, thinking the plane was going to swerve back up and fly away but it never emerged. I remember asking him what happened, and he was just silent. After a bit, he started driving again, and we drove over to the area. We drove around for probably an hour, trying to find some explanation, but there was nothing. Eventually, we headed back to my grandmother's place. We had dinner and explained to her what had happened, but she probably just thought we were crazy. I remember us being eager to turn on the evening news to see if there was any mention of it, but nothing. Also nothing in the paper the next day. There was no real internet yet, so this was all we had. To this day, my dad and I still discuss this. The one thing we can't remember is if the plane was making any sound at all while it was flying in the air. Our radio might have been on or the windows up. We can't remember but we know for certain that there was no sound from the supposed crash. It was only about a half mile away from us, so we would have heard something. It's like the plane literally vanished. This is the only experience I've ever had like this. I know it's a long shot, but has anyone ever experienced something like this? Do you have any idea what we saw? There's great comfort in knowing that my dad saw the same thing. Otherwise... I would have thought I imagined it, but we didn't imagine it. We saw it, and we still want answers. For about the last year, I've been seeing flashes of movement, pitch black shadows, in my peripheral vision. I've heard my name clearly called on three separate occasions by a deep male voice when I know I was home alone in the house and I've started waking up covered in bruises and occasionally scratches. They're almost exclusively on my legs. The worst of it was the day I woke up with over 30 fresh bruises, some the size of softballs, many that look like random fingerprints. About three months ago, I visited a local metaphysical store and shared my experiences with them. Based on my experiences and the photo I gave them of my bruises, they did a remote cleansing, and, on their advice, I did a sage and holy wood burning in my home, buried black tourmaline at the four corners of my property, and placed one over the door to my bedroom. Everything had been fine since then, but the bruises are coming back, and on Sunday, I saw a large black figure slip along the ceiling after my husband as he walked out of the room in a particularly bad mood. This thing was pitch black, like I said, and moving faster than my husband was walking. It was not at all possible that it was his shadow. I'm not exactly sure how he feels about the subject. On the one hand, he probably thinks I'm crazy. He asked what the black stone was all over the bedroom door. So I told him a truncated version of the truth about my visit to the metaphysical store. I left out hearing voices. He didn't say anything. On the other hand, he keeps saints in his truck for safe travel. He was raised Catholic. So I think he's open-minded to a certain degree. 
We have two cats and two dogs who have all seemed to react to the unseen disturbances as well. Cats will stare at the wall or the ceiling. I write it off to passing cars throwing reflections and so on. My older dog has started barking at a corner in the middle of the day. I chalked it up to him going senile. He is an 11-year-old St. Bernard mix. But the other night, I had just laid down to go to sleep and was trying to find a nature documentary on Netflix to put me out when I heard something in the guest room next door to my room fall. It sounded like a little picture frame or a decoration from the dresser. One of my dogs, who likes to sleep on that bed, ran into the master bedroom, jumped in bed with us, and was shaking like a leaf. I assumed it was kitty mischief, or that the dog had knocked something over, thus the shaking, and I would deal with it the next day. The only thing is, I checked first thing in the morning, and there was nothing out of place, and my husband said he hadn't put anything back either. I have a feeling this thing is targeting my husband. He is very stressed out at work. He works 50 plus hours per week at a job that, quote, destroys his soul, as he puts it and another 20 plus hours per week trying to help keep our new business flourishing. He's very weak right now, emotionally and physically. He's very depressed about his day job and has chronic bronchitis, and I believe something nasty is trying to take advantage. I'd like to talk to him about it, but one, I'm afraid that admitting I know it's there will make it more powerful, and two, I'm afraid he'll think I'm nuts. But I know what I saw, and I know that I wasn't drinking or on any medications. I wasn't on drugs, and I'm not diagnosed with anything that would make me hallucinate. I know what I saw. Maybe I'm just stringing together random events here, but does this make sense to anyone? This happened in March of 2011, near my house in a small town about an hour north of Indianapolis, Indiana. I was in eighth grade at the time, and it was during my spring break. That year, instead of sunshine and warm weather for spring break, there was a snowstorm, probably around eight inches or so of snow. My two friends, my two younger brothers and I, decided to make the best of it and just go play in the snow for the day. There was woods near my house, not a huge woods, but big enough to hike around in for a few hours. So we decided to do just that. About an hour into the hike, we stumbled upon what looked like an old well, a stone circle about ten feet in diameter, about four feet high off the ground, and partially filled with foul-smelling, half-frozen water. We threw a few rocks into it, and stuck long tree branches in to try to find out how deep it was. We tried with a branch that was at least 20 feet long, but we were never able to hit the bottom, so it was pretty deep. Now, the well by itself wasn't really creepy or anything, but how old it looked, and the way it was just stuck out in the middle of the woods, was a little unnerving. The part that really terrified us came about 20 minutes after discovering the well. We had decided that we were done messing around with it, and had just started to continue on into the woods, when we all heard something that made us freeze dead in our tracks with fear. Echoing through the woods came a loud, shrieking laugh. It was a high-pitched, grating voice that was still very loud despite seeming like it had come from somewhat far away. We all just froze for a moment, trying to make sense of what we'd just heard. The laugh came again, this time distinctly closer to us, but still not in our immediate vicinity. At that moment, none of us were saying a word. We bolted back the way we came, away from the sound, in the direction of my house. We didn't stop running for what seemed like forever, and we eventually made it back to my house without any more incidents. None of us had a clue as to what we had just heard, and none of us were ever brave enough to go back there and try to figure it out. 
I would love to hear any thoughts about what it could have been, paranormal or otherwise. I don't know if the part about the well was relevant or not, but it could have been, so I thought I would include it in my story. This is a very real story, and it's something that I personally experienced, and to this day I've never been able to explain it. So if you can, let me know. The other night, around 9.30 at night, I was playing Smash Ultimate in my living room, minding my own business while I was watching horror videos. It was nothing special, a fairly normal occurrence. Then suddenly, as the narrator finished a story about a skinwalker, I felt it. The most extreme feeling of being watched I have ever felt. I could pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. The window to my right. My window has blinds, but they suck, and they're easy enough to see through if you get close to the window. Personally, I believe in the paranormal, and I do believe my house is haunted. But the ghosts in my house have only ever been pranksters who are rather kind-hearted. As a note, I also live in Arizona, not too far from a Native American reservation. Anyway, this feeling was intensely strong and struck an immediate response in my brain, which is typically pragmatic and relatively fearless. I paused the game, turned off the switch, and went straight into my room, closing the doors behind me, turning off the videos, and instead turning on Critical Role. Yet the feeling stayed, as if whatever was watching me could see through my doors. I had enough, so I grabbed my machete, it was a gift from my grandpa that I used while camping, and unsheathed it, then walked straight to the window, peering through it. There was nothing. Nothing but my neighbor's house. But the feeling hadn't subsided. I decided to take a more supernatural approach. I found the sage in the kitchen, grabbed a lighter, and began to burn it, spreading the smoke around my house, until it felt like the feeling had passed. Then I grabbed some clothes and took the bowl into the bathroom with me, and showered. The feeling was completely gone, as if the sage had repelled whatever was watching me. It was certainly freaky. I'm not sure if it was a skinwalker or not, or if my body just picked up on someone watching me who left when they saw my weapon. But whatever it was, it was strange. Everything I'm about to tell you happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll just give you the facts of what happened, and you can draw your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm from Russia originally, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about the idea. As we're hiking, it starts pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest, until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All of this time, we're just talking about random things and getting to know each other, while not really paying a lot of attention to our surroundings. There's no one around, since we've gone pretty deep in already, and it was pouring buckets, like I said. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and I thought that was pretty cool. We kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It's a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we didn't think anything of it and kept going. Within seconds, we heard the cry right next to us, which seemed so strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud that it couldn't have been more than a few feet away. We start looking all around even looking at the trees, but absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound started right up again, right next to us. 
like something was telling us to book it. So we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird, and we decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started popping up. It turns out the place was a site of ancient Native American burial grounds. I'm not surprised, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and that he wanted to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think this is a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him, for kicks, you know. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, I decided to go along, thinking that I could keep them out of trouble. Twenty-something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, after all. So we hop in the car and we drive out there. The traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn, so we get there at about 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now, there are no streetlights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road, and flashlights can only do our visibility so much good, so it's pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actual deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We were not supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but there was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding on or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, started saying, there's nothing here. He kept mocking and then all of a sudden he stopped. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic. One I have never felt before in a forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly we hear crunching coming toward us from out of the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking around and mocking seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. Nobody says a word until we get to the other side. Then Ryan says, I was just nervous because it, it might have been a homeless person and, you know, I, I didn't want to deal with that. Sure. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked. Alongside the road, I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s. She looked to be either Native American or a mixture of Asian and Latina. She was walking along the highway wearing very little clothing, and she looked... off. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost... I don't know the right word for it. Vibrating? Undulating? I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles. Just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian, and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of roads killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or not. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, and nodded. I was hit with that same feeling I got back there in the forest, and I almost regretted slowing down. Whatever, screw it. My sense of wanting to help this girl was greater than whatever weird crap I was feeling. If I died, at least I would die with a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat, and next to Ryan. He's a womanizer, and he starts to chatter up, asking where she's from and what she's doing out here all by herself. All this time, I'm turned halfway around, keeping an eye on her, because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's making consistent eye contact with me the entire time, 
even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, slightly vibrating. I don't know, it just seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and without taking her eyes off me, she says, Oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except that there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home, and she gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car, along nothing but forest. My eyes hurt from making eye contact with her, and she just kept smiling and undulating. This feeling of dread just kept increasing. So eventually we just dropped her off at her street. Lots of old-looking small houses. When I turned back to look just a second later, she was gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining that creepy smile. I imagined her creeping upstairs in the dark, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. I've seen spirits all of my life. I interact with human ones. I've seen the spirits of some of my deceased pets, but last week I saw something different. I work more than one job, but one has a stockroom. It is on land leased from one of several local tribes. It was tribal land for centuries before there was a highway built through the center of it in a mountain pass. In the stock area, we have racks that can be rolled. These are called lundias. About a year ago, I confided in a friend that there were in fact some odd spirits there. My friend asked me if I had seen the ones in the stockroom. He said they were some sort of gremlin-like shadows and that he had seen them at night. I did not see or sense any of them for a long time. When I saw some last week, I remembered his comments. They are odd. They're black, shadowy things. They're different, about two and a half to three feet long. They run in the lundias, low to the ground. A former co-worker asked me over two years ago if I had seen them running through the nearby desert. I told her I had never seen anything like them, but I have seen them now. They are hunched over at the spine, so their heads are lower than their backs. Their backs are rounded. The vertebrae are fairly well defined. They don't expect to be seen. They're sort of coyote-like, and sort of dog-like, as if they were the victims of some terrible spinal disease. They have dark fur or hair on the spine, thinning to bare skin on the bellies. Their legs are bent at the knees like dogs, in the back, and bent at the knees in the front. Their faces are dog-like with canine-style teeth. I know they have been there for many, many centuries. Some sort of nature spirits, maybe? Either way, I don't plan to bother them at all. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky. It runs above the Mammoth Cave System the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc. And we camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most times. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there's nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountain's black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. The second day, around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon, about 30 feet wide and so deep the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, 
and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired, and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about ten feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, but not like an owl screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower-pitched at the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere Kentucky, most likely it was a fox, or a boar, or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap, not a single leaf crinkle, when, whatever it was, finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening, maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but no one had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided this would have to do, as we didn't want to go farther down the river and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split into two, and in the middle formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass, and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs, again, otherworldly. We set up camp, eight, and all went to bed at around the same time. It was silent for probably twenty to thirty minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. I was having a dream, but suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling and confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all just decided that it was a falling tree, and went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more. It didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river, one last time, to head home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the weird things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. No mysterious forest noises, no crashing, no metallic groaning in the middle of the night, nothing. To both my disappointment and relief. This is a true story that happened to me, my girlfriend Amy, and my stepsister Rose. This happened when I was 13 on a summer night in July. It was dark, 
and I lived in a trailer park at the time in Ohio. I lived in a small town. Not very small, but you get the idea. You can't find it on a lot of maps. The layout is kind of odd, with two entrances, one by the center and one in the back. The trailer park is basically three connected loops and one going uphill with its own road. The first loop has two roads on what we call the hill. The farthest road up is by a small patch of woods and is the darkest part of the trailer park at night. Sometimes one of the streetlights wouldn't come on. It was by the farthest turn from the entrance and really dark at night. I lived by the center entrance in trailer four. At the time, my girlfriend and I weren't dating, but we still hung out a lot. She lived a row down from me, but it was easy just to cut through the yards to get to her house. That night, Amy and I were arguing about something pretty stupid, as teens do. Rose is a couple of years younger than Amy and I, but liked to be with us anyway. We were on the hill, just turning onto the darkest street, when Rose decided she didn't want to deal with Amy and I arguing anymore. She sped ahead of us, and I watched her ride off. I wasn't worried, since she was surprisingly smart and strong for her age. She's also pretty tall. Unfortunately, her character doesn't quite fit her build, as she's pretty shy. Anyway, she went ahead of us and got to the darkest point of that street, the corner, and froze. She looked up into the woods. No, stared into the woods. Terrified. I attempted to catch up to her, but before I could get to her, she turned and took off on her scooter. I stopped and waited for Amy to catch up. Of course, she yelled at me for running like that. She thought I was trying to ditch her. I apologized and told her that I wanted to ask Rose why she'd gone so far ahead of us. I knew if I told her about Rose stopping and looking in the woods, she would want to investigate. Though I brushed it off as her getting scared of a shadow, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching us as we passed that area. A little while later, Amy decided to walk off to cool down. I didn't stop her. In fact, I didn't blame her. I can get pretty annoying at times. What concerned me, though, was that we still hadn't seen Rose. After Amy walked off, I circled the trailer park a couple of times before I finally saw her. She was on the complete opposite side of the trailer park from where she took off. I ran up to her, yelling out her name. As I got closer, I realized that she was close to crying. She began rambling about something in the woods, about how she thought whatever it was got me and Amy. I calmed her down to explain to me what she saw. Now, here's a disclaimer. Bear with me here. I know people are going to be like, oh, this is vague because of what I explain. And no, I'm not making this a Slenderman story. This is what she saw, and it will not be the only spirit or person we see. Again, this is not some kind of Slenderman ripoff. In fact, whatever this thing is, I still see this guy from time to time. Anyway, back to the story. She told me that whatever she saw had no face, just a place where sockets and a nose would be. They were tall, with pale skin, and an all-black suit, except the undershirt, which almost matched their skin. I was sure she was seeing things, but to make her feel better, I decided that we should go back up to the woods and look. She agreed, and we made our way out to the woods. Once we got back to the road, we walked silently, listening for anything that might be in the woods. We heard nothing. But the entire time, we felt as though we were being watched. Once we made it to the corner, we still hadn't seen or heard anything. I had her go ahead of me, just in case. As I started to calm down, thinking it was nothing, I felt like somebody may have been following us. When I turned around, I swear that I saw what she did, standing in the tree line, just staring in our direction. I felt myself begin to panic, but remained calm on the outside. I told Rose just to keep moving. As we walked, I realized that whatever was there was inching closer to us, coming out of the woods. They were about seven feet tall. They didn't seem to be moving any of their body parts. They were just floating. When we turned the next corner, I told her to go as fast as she could, and I ran to keep up with her. Once we made it off the hill, we went back to our house and went inside. 
But once I went in, I realized Amy was still out there on her own. I told Rose I was going to go find her. I tried to make her stay, but she insisted on coming with me. So I let her. We found her around where I had found Rose. I previously forgot to tell Rose not to tell Amy about the figure in the woods, but before I could say anything, Rose blurted the whole story out. Amy thought somebody was just messing with us and decided that she was going to go into the woods and confront them on her own. Exactly what I was afraid of. I tried to talk her out of it the entire time we walked there. Of course, my words didn't faze her, and she went up into the woods anyway. I yelled that I was going to walk Rose home, and that I'd be back. As we walked down the hill, about halfway, I heard a distant, inhuman shriek come out of the woods. I told Rose to run home as fast as she could, and I turned back, running to see if Amy was okay. I didn't get very far before I saw her running. Mind you, this was the first time I had ever seen her scared after three years of knowing her, so I knew something was wrong. I stopped, and she just kept saying, Run! Run home! So we all fled back to my house. Once we got there, we were all tired, panting, and sweaty. You should have seen how confused my mother was. She asked us what was wrong, but I knew she wouldn't believe us. And even if she did, I didn't want her involved with this. So I just told her that we had decided to run back, as some kind of competition. We all went to my room and closed the curtains. We also turned the closet light on and closed the door. We all sat down, and I asked Amy what she saw when she was up there. She told me that she saw a tall black shadow. No legs, but they did have arms. And they were about eight feet tall, and they were carrying something large and dripping. Their back was turned to her, so she shouted to them. She started swearing and yelling. Once they turned around, though, they looked directly at her, revealing a white porcelain mask with red lips and markings above the eyes. It stretched out an empty arm, pointing at her before letting out a loud shriek, and that's when she ran out of the woods and told us to go. The rest of the night, the two beings harassed all three of us, there are three particular moments I remember vividly. The first was when I looked into the yard through my curtains. They both stood there, staring into the window. The second, we all went outside to look for my cat. I looked under a car for him, but fell back when I saw the one without a face laying there, just staring back at me, his head tilted in a curiously twisted manner. Don't worry, we did eventually find the cat and bring him inside. The third one I didn't actually see, but Amy told me about it. She said when we came back to my room after looking, she saw a pair of feet behind my closet door. When she looked away and looked back, they were gone. After that, we turned the light off and ignored the closet. I managed to convince my mom to let her stay the night that night, but we didn't sleep much. Rose ended up falling asleep around two in the morning and Amy and I fell asleep on the couch together at about 4.30. The next day, Rose and Amy and I decided to go up to the woods and investigate the area where Amy saw the masked one. As we suspected, when we got there, there was blood on the tree that the entity had stood by, and a trail of blood on the path leading to some bushes. For the sake of not wanting to find anything we couldn't unsee, we decided not to look in the bushes and walked out of the woods. Ever since then, these entities have been following us and communicating with us. They taught us about their meetings and stuff like that. I have attended a few, but hardly remember what I did or said. But Crescent, the masked one, and Faceless, pretty self-explanatory, are not the only ones. There's also Leo, who looks like Crescent, but is slightly taller, only has one eye hole in his mask, and is missing an arm, who's second in command. There's Angel, who always walks with a noose hanging around her throat. The Weeper, who's covered in bruises and cuts and slits all over. He leaves blood and tears wherever he goes. The Puppeteer is the leader. He can control whoever he wants, but gives great pain to himself and whoever is around while he takes over someone. And then there's the Executioner. If you see him, that usually means something bad is going to happen to you or someone close to you soon. He's a tall, cloaked figure, no lie, about 20 feet tall. 
You can't see his face, but when you see him, it's kind of creepy. Before I moved away, I was walking the trailer park pretty late, and I looked up. Across the main road that the trailer park sat behind in a storage unit lot, I saw him standing there. I got so angry I ran at him. Once I reached the middle of the road, he vanished completely. And then, I noticed a car coming down the road, speeding. Luckily, I got out of the way. A month after seeing him, my father died of cardiac arrest. The blood vessels in his heart constricted so tightly that blood couldn't flow through it, and it failed. The worst thing is, no matter what, they always find you. Not too long ago, I moved away from the trailer park, but they found me. I still see Leo and Crescent around, walking in the woods or watching me. It's terrifying. I don't know what they want, but they always find me. At school, at home, at the mall. Hell, they followed me to North Carolina on a vacation once. I had to stay away from my family there so they wouldn't take interest in them. I currently think that Leo is attempting to get revenge on me for calling him a one-armed bastard at a meeting. You should have seen how pissed Amy was the next time I saw her. She was like, you're such an idiot, they're gonna kill you. I brushed it off, but I don't know. I guess he's still pissed about it. Anyway, I hope you at least enjoyed this story, but if you have any suggestions on what I should do, or you know what they are, let me know. I was with my niece, who's on her high school soccer team, and is taking it pretty seriously, and attempting to get some kind of scholarship out of it. I'm pretty healthy, and I don't really work out too much, but something I often do is run and hike. I live in Kentucky, not in a rural part, but there's a state park near my house that's 6,500 acres, so it's pretty secluded and densely wooded. There are some really nice trails that allow you to run for a good chunk and then hike for a bit to split up the long bits of the trail that are flat. She decided to tag along with me today for a quick three to four mile run. It was raining, but nothing too heavy. Kind of a spitting rain. Nothing we can't handle. We got up to the peak of this one hill, and it had been about two miles or so, according to our phones. So we decided to turn back and head back to the car. As we were headed down the steep side of the climb, we were walking pretty slowly, just to make sure we didn't slip and lose our footing. When out of nowhere, there was the coldest chill that came from behind us once we made it about halfway down. At the time it happened, we both commented on how cold it was, but we didn't make too much out of it, and just went on with our conversation. In these woods, there are some wildlife, like small deer and maybe some coyotes, but they tend to stay away from the paths. At least I have only heard them in my many years of coming here. Never once have I seen anything more than a few tracks. Once we got off the hillside and hit a stretch of the trail that was flatter ground, we began to pick up the pace when a deer darted across the path, maybe ten yards in front of us, causing us to stop in our tracks. The first deer was then followed by three more, and not one of them even so much as looked in our direction. My niece looked at me, puzzled because of the oddity of it. To me, they acted like they were running from something, a predator of some kind. Once they'd gone, we started back with our run, and we heard a noise behind us, a loud, booming noise of something of substance falling to the ground from some height. When we stopped and turned, we saw nothing. No animals scurrying away like one would expect after a substantial noise in the wilderness. In fact, everything was eerily calm. Just as we looked at each other to ask what the actual hell that was, there was yet another cold wind gush through the valley, pushing all the rain off the leaves surrounding us, soaking our sweatshirts. Internally, I started to freak out, but I was doing my best to stay calm for my 17-year-old niece but I'm pretty sure she could tell that I was freaked out. I tell her, come on, let's get to the car. And we turn to take off again. And there was a man, leaned up against a tree on the side of the trail dressed in a black suit with a white button-up shirt. His collar was open, but he had a tie on, sagging like a tired businessman on the way home from a long day. It startled me at first. I wasn't expecting to see anybody out there for a few reasons. 
One is that we were at the very least a mile away from any parking lot or street. Another being that we never heard or saw him coming. And the stretch of trail we were on was flat and open for a good half a mile. I got over to put myself between the man and my niece as we jogged past him. When we did, I looked him in the eye and gave him a how you doin' nod as we went along. He was sort of pale. His eyes were very white, but his irises were ice blue. Everything that I saw from the quick look I got up close looked to be clean cut and proper. I didn't notice a speck of mud anywhere on him, and the two of us had it caked on the bottom of our shoes and even on the backs of our pants and shirts from kicking it up as we ran. We had to get to the top of another hill, smaller than the last, but still quite the hike up. Once on top, I took a quick look behind us, and he had seemed to vanish without a trace. Now with having the vantage point of the hill, I could see out past the trail, and see most of the hill that she and I had just come from, and yet he was nowhere in sight. I scanned off the sides of the trail, and still nothing. My niece asked me who that guy was and why he was out so deep in the woods wearing a suit, questions I simply didn't have the answers to. We made it back to the car with nothing else out of the ordinary happening to us on the trail. As we came to my car, I pulled the keys from my pocket and unlocked the doors for maybe ten feet out. Walking up to the only car in the entire lot, I noticed muddy footprints coming away from my car door from the driver's side. Weird, considering I had no mud on my shoes when we got there. But there are trails leading up to the lot, so I figured maybe somebody came through before we got there and I just never noticed. However, when I pulled the handle to open the door, the handle was caked with mud underneath, almost like somebody was attempting to open my door with a muddy hand. Nothing more happened, but the entire encounter leaves chills covering my body the more I think about it. My mother and father divorced when I was eight. I lived with my father until late 1995. I was 13 when I moved in with my mother, but in 2002 I had a falling out with my stepfather and ended up moving in with my father. My father lived in the country while my mother lived in a small town. My father's home was surrounded by a forest with few neighbors situated on a hill. When I was a child, I used to walk through the woods, so I knew them really well. In 2004, my father's home burned to the ground and we left the area, moving into a small town and living in an apartment. I ended up in college studying film and I was tasked with making a film course. I decided to shoot a short film about a serial killer stalking campers in the woods, because apparently I was really unoriginal at the time. So me and my two friends Adam and Zach were looking for locations. I figured the forest where I used to live would be perfect because it was in the middle of nowhere and there would be no sounds. So we did what you normally do, scout locations. One for the campsite, and routes that the protagonist and antagonist would take through the forest. We arrived and were deep in the woods, as this time only one person still lived in the area, and he wasn't home, nor did he own all the land, so we stayed well clear of his land. As we were moving through the forest, trying to find the perfect clearing, all was quiet, which was startling, because though we were deep in the woods, the sounds of birds and bugs were kind of a normal thing. It was in the afternoon, so there really wasn't any reason for the forest to be silent. We came across a clearing that I knew well, but it was different. When I was a child, deep in the forest there was an old wooden structure. It was flat, and we called it the stage because that's what it looked like. It was in a clearing, right next to a tree line with a wide field that could fit hundreds of people there for a concert. Whether that's what it was, or it was something as simple as the floor of an old shack, I don't know. All I know was when I had gotten there, there was a camper, and someone built a pond right in the middle of the clearing. We decided that clearly somebody was using the space, so it would be best to find a different spot. We went to the tree line and descended down a steep hill to a creek. 
all the while, talking to ourselves about how weird the silence was. If you live in or around a forest, you hear wildlife all the time. The lack of it in such a dense area was strange. We crossed the creek and made our way through fallen trees and large rocks, until we found ourselves in a very wooded area. Adam had noticed first and pointed to a grouping of trees that made a perfect circle. Under the dead leaves lay stones, arranged in a circle, and in the center was broken bottles. I walked over to it and ended up tripping. I braced myself with my forearm and deeply cut it on a broken bottle. As I stood up, the silence was broken by a loud scream. It sounded human, female, but it was a scream. I turned to where I thought it came from, and beyond the trees, in the brush, I saw something red run off. We decided to head back. As we came back to the stage and pond area, a truck pulled up. The guy that was the only person living in the area ordered us into his truck to take us out of the area. He said that he owned all that area and that we were trespassing. He knew me, so he didn't give me a hard time or threaten me. He dropped us off, and I asked him how he had known we were there. I didn't, he said. I just heard some scream and thought some idiot fell in the pond. I ended up with stitches in my arm after going to the ER. I only have two plausible explanations for that scream. First is that we didn't know what was beyond the brush. It could have been a home, and maybe kids were playing. While the scream was loud and I saw something bright red running, we could have startled someone. But the problem with that theory is that the guy who came in the truck heard it too. And we were far enough away from where he lived to where he would have a hard time hearing it. The only other one is that the scream had come from behind us, and because of the trees, sound echoing made me think it was in front of us. This might account for how the guy had heard it too. His home is halfway to the stage area, which is why he was able to get there so fast. But that doesn't account for the red thing I saw, or what the scream was in the first place. And no, I don't think it was a fox or anything like that. I've spent enough time in the woods to know what those sound like. And the red that I saw wasn't like that of a fox. It was bright red, like dyed fabric. I still am completely unable to explain this. This is one of the most magical and unbelievable experiences I've ever had. A few years back, I went to an outdoor electronic music festival and was riding a natural high. No drugs, other than a little bit of pot, so a drug. The first night, at around midnight, the party is starting to amp up. I'm really into the music and I'm connecting with the DJ like there's no tomorrow. We're making almost constant eye contact and it's obvious he's aware of how deeply I'm appreciating the music. As the set goes on, we're connecting more and more. I know he can tell that I'm fully involved and giving my all to everything around me. Finally, he motions with his hand for me to turn around. I whip my head around to look behind me for one second, and when I turn it back, my jaw is dropped, and I'm absolutely stunned. For the second that I looked back, I saw several brilliantly blue, humanoid, glowing beings walking intensely and purposefully through the forest. I just stood there, in stupefied amazement, staring at the DJ with my mouth hanging open. As he looked back at me, he slowly and knowingly nodded his head. The beings looked exactly like the ones depicted in the movie Knowing. Note that I hadn't seen that movie yet when I experienced this, though. They looked like humans, without the hair, but they glow with a brilliant blue, almost white light, and you can see through them. I told one of my friends about the experience, and he said that they're called the Devas, and that he is another friend who's seen them too. 